Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at 10, I'm Helena Humphrey. A 38 year old man is arrested on suspicion of the murder of school teacher Sabina Nessa in what police call a significant development. Avoiding Christmas chaos, temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are given the go ahead, but business leaders say it's not enough. And boxing champion Anthony Joshua loses his world titles after being defeated by Alexander Yusik. Police have arrested a 38-year-old man on suspicion of murdering Sabina Nessa, calling it a significant development in the investigation. The man was apprehended at an address in East Sussex at around 3 a.m. this morning. Sabina Nessa, a 28-year-old primary school teacher, was murdered while walking through a park in southeast London just over a week ago. Government plans to give up to 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas are not enough and barely scratch the surface, according to business leaders. Ministers want to avoid disruption to the supply chain in the run-up to Christmas after a shortage of lorry drivers caused problems with petrol stations, supermarkets and fast food chains. This weekend, there have been long queues at four courts across the country. The Labour leader has promised children in England an education fit for the future if he wins power at the next general election. Sir Keir Starmer says he wants to make sure that all pupils leave school ready for work and life. He says taxing private schools will pay for it. Three people have died and more than 50 others have been injured after a train derailed in the U.S. state of Montana. Several carriages on an Empire Builder service came off the tracks at 4 o'clock local time. 141 passengers and 16 crew members were on board at the time. 
The Home Secretary will lead tributes at a service in Lincolnshire later to commemorate National Police Memorial Day taking place today. Officers and family members will remember those who lost their lives in service. It's really important that we come together as a family, as a policing family, to remember those colleagues we've lost from all parts of the country over many years. And not only to remember and to reflect, but also to reassure the family members of those officers we have lost that their loved ones will never, ever be forgotten. And Anthony Joshua's reign as world heavyweight champion was ended last night after losing to Alexander Yusik at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. I can't go back and salt. That's wasting time. I'm going back to look at ways I can improve straight away. I've already been watching the fight and figuring out, oh, I could have done that better already in my mind anyway. So, yeah, I'm not too bothered. But what I'm bothered about is how much better I can get. And your weather turning cooler and more unsettled today with wet and windy weather on its way. Southern parts may see sunshine this afternoon. That's your live news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Good morning and welcome to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio on the 17th floor of Talk Radio Towers. I look outside and once again, the weather is grey. The sky is grey, which is a bit like how it feels to be living in the UK at the moment. It's 10.04. We have an action-packed show and I want your input, your thoughts, your calls. Do you remember last week I said, I asked the big question, who's in charge? Was it the parents? Was it the kids? It clearly wasn't the government. And now we have to ask the same question again. Do you remember when I said that if Kwasi Kwarteng says there's no cause for immediate concern, guess what, folks? Of sure enough, if you believe the opposite of what these ministers say, you'll be closer to the truth because there's cause for immediate concern. It turns out that we're not sure who's in charge. Is it a Muppet called Kermit? Is it Putin? Is it the lorry drivers? Or is it the press scare tactics? I want your thoughts. Who do you think is in charge of this country? It's clearly not the Prime Minister. It's clearly not the government. So give me your thoughts, your views. We've got some amazing guests. We have, of course, got my Sunday sermon. And yes, I'm going to be talking about that this energy crisis, these huge energy bills that we're all going to suffer, this was totally predictable, totally self-inflicted and an utter disgrace. My special guest today is the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, former Tory leadership contender in 2019, Esther McVeigh. It'll be great to hear what she's got to say. I've also got a Labour peer, yes, Lord Andrew Adonis on to talk about the Labour Party, their shenanigans, their conference, what's going on, what's his thoughts. And we'll be talking about the new Scottish drugs policy that's just appeared from nowhere. We'll be talking to a Liberal Democrat MP. So we're going across the whole political spectrum here this morning. We've got a great professor, Carol Sakura, talking about capacity or not in the NHS as we head towards winter. So much more, but give me your thoughts. Call me 0344 499 1000. Text me, talk at 8722. Tweet at Talk Radio. I look forward to reading your tweets out. I want to hear from you. And don't forget, you can watch us live, all the action, me and the guests on Talk Radio TV. Don't forget to download the app or on Apple TV, Samsung, YouTube, and a raft of other TV stations. You're listening to Tice Talk. Don't go away. It's the one and only, the only home of common sense. It's Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker, this is Talk Radio. Well, thanks for joining me here on Tice Talk this Sunday morning. And I think it really is time for what's, what I feel is a pretty passionate Sunday sermon from me, because it is quite extraordinary what is going on. Literally, as we speak, millions of people are receiving letters from their energy companies, their utility companies, with huge price rises. 
I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pounds as we head towards winter. And it's only September. It's not even cold yet, folks. So listen in. I just want you for a moment, just take a step back. Just close your eyes. And let's imagine a nation that until about a decade ago was a big net exporter of gas. Imagine a nation that has decades and decades worth of accessible oil, of accessible gas, off its coastline, in the waters around the islands of this nation, but that that nation decides not to use it. Imagine a nation that has over 50 years worth of cheap, accessible shale gas, literally under our feet, possibly under your feet, if you're listening or watching from the middle of England. But you decide this nation's leaders, in their infinite wisdom, decides not to use that gas, not to access it, because it's a little bit scared of the eco-zealots and the eco-bullets who get upset, the eco-bullies. Seriously? Imagine a nation whose leaders say that instead of using our own cheap, easily accessible gas, no, 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 we won't do that, folks. We're going to pay and send lots of money overseas to import expensive gas from a raft of nations, including from rogue states like Russia, in other words, from Vladimir, and therefore we're completely at his whim if he wants to reduce the supply and increase the price. Imagine a nation, folks, that is subsidising one company £800 million a year to chop down acres and acres and thousands of acres of woodland in North America, more woodland than the, than the UK produces every year itself, in order to chop that wood down, to, to turn it into wood pellets, to ship it across the Atlantic Ocean in order to burn it in a power station here. Oh, and by the way, in order to fix the numbers, they don't count the CO2 of the wood that's burned, and they don't count the CO2 from the shipping fuel that's used to ship all these wood pellets across the Atlantic Ocean. Just imagine that. Does that sound sensible to you? I want you to call me. Imagine a nation that decides, now we don't need to have any form of storage of our own gas, you know, in case there's a bit of a hiccup in case there's a problem? Do we need to have a contingency storage supply of our own gas on our own shores? No, 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 don't worry about that. We'll close our own facilities down. We'll outsource that storage. We'll pay money to another country to outsource that contingency storage. And I'm sure the good folk of Netherlands, you know, they'll send the gas over to us when we call for it, except, of course, when they've got a shortage. And what do you think they're going to do then? Do you think they're really going to send the gas over? Because what we saw, for example, from the PPE crisis is that when things go wrong, when the chips are down, they often go wrong across the world for everybody at the same time. Not very start smart. We literally have about five or six days worth of gas storage. Other European nations have 10 to 20 times as much storage in their own country we decided actually we should outsource it. Imagine a nation that lets its own world-leading nuclear industry wither on the vine. Instead, we thought it was a good idea that we'd be quite happy paying our neighbours, the French, to supply us electricity through what turns out to be a bit of a dodgy, unreliable connector that breaks just at the time when we need it most. Great. Imagine a nation that thinks it's a good idea when we've got to belatedly build some more nuclear power stations, that thinks it's a good idea to use billions of pounds of finance from none other than the Chinese communist regime. Yes, I'm serious, folks. Chinese, the Chinese state is funding in a significant way the building of a nuclear power station down at Hinkley Point. And then Imagine a nation whose leaders then say to those same Chinese uh, state-owned entity, I tell you what, folks, um, once you've done that, what about designing, building, manufacturing and operating another nuclear power station quite close to the nation's capital? That sounds a good idea, isn't it? To let what is essentially a bullying rogue state right into the heart of our own shores. Imagine a nation that thinks it's a good idea to pay 10 billion pounds a year in subsidies to the wind 
and solar power renewable companies, most of whom are overseas owned investors, overseas private equity groups. That's a cost to every family of almost £200 per household per year. And not content with paying them those 10 billion of subsidies, imagine a nation that thinks then actually we might need to pay another £2 billion to those same people in order sometimes to turn the wind turbines off in case the wind is blowing at the wrong time, at the wrong speed, in the wrong place, and we haven't quite got the cables to deal with it. I mean, seriously? And imagine a nation who's led by a prime minister that wants to get rid of perfectly good gas boilers and replace them with expensive, unreliable, noisy, large heat pumps that won't heat our water or our rooms to anything like the same temperature and will cost everybody a lot more and which will therefore inevitably lead to your parents and your grandparents literally freezing in their own homes. Imagine a nation whose Prime Minister says it's easy going green, it's lucrative going green. What planet is that Prime Minister living on? He was of course talking about it's lucrative for some of the big business, the overseas private equity group that own these uh, these wind turbines. But it's not lucrative for the tens of millions of British families who are receiving huge energy bill increases, literally as I speak. Now, I've got some bad news, folks, because this is not a dream. This is not some far-fetched storyline in a James Bond movie with a ridiculous Blofeld-like villain. I'm afraid to say that this is actually a real nightmare. And I'm also afraid to say that the nation in question is our beloved United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We have the most expensive electricity in Europe. Our gas is four times more expensive than in the United States of America, even though it could be at a very similar price if we used our own gas. And most of this nightmare most of this expensive energy is totally down to the leadership, the incompetence, the weak, short-sighted decisions taken mainly by Tory politicians and, in my view, incompetent civil servants over the last decade. They have failed to properly plan for contingencies. And, of course, far too many of those civil servants, where are they? Well, they're working from home. This Conservative government, just, just remember, just over three years ago, in their 2017 manifesto, they promised us that we could create thousands of jobs with a new shale gas industry, literally under our feet. Cheap energy for all. And then, of course, they bottled it at the first sign of a few eco-bullies. Really and truly, we are a great nation of lions, in my view, led by donkeys. We can do so much better. We deserve so much better. Here endeth the sermon. Call me. Do you agree that we are badly led? Or do you think we're well led? Or maybe you're not quite sure? Call me. 0344 499 1000. Tweet me at Talk Radio. I want to hear your thoughts, your views. you got my view here on Tice Talk at the home of common sense. It's Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 20 minutes past 10. I've just finished my Sunday morning, and that seems to have got you going. The first tweet's coming in. Uh, we've got one here. Agree with your sermon. We should cancel HS2, spend the money saved on power, self-sufficiency across the board, including restoring British ownership of critical, important infrastructure. That's from Peter in North Ants. I agree a lot there, Peter. There's another one here saying that everything in this government turns to dust. Well, this is serious. This really is absolutely crucial to families up and down the country. The cost and the predictability of our energy supply and uh, energies, uh, whatever it is, whether it's gas, whether it's oil, the cost of our electricity, it's so, so expensive and it's so unnecessary. And to talk with this uh, about this more, I'm delighted now to be joined on the line by Rupert Darwall, who is a real expert who's written about this for decades. He's a senior fellow of the Real Clear Foundation. He's author of the Green Tyranny. And Rupert, a very good morning. Thanks to jo for joining us this Sunday morning. I guess in a way that this crisis is is no real surprise to you. It's probably just a great sadness because you've, you've been seeing this coming down, literally down the pipe, um, way before anybody else. I mean, how does this make you feel now? Well, it is, this crisis has been 10 years in the making, and as you suggest, it's wholly predictable. The actual sort of the spike in gas prices and so forth, the actual trigger points for this crisis, perhaps less predictable. But when you, base, when you basically go from an electricity system, which we had in 2010, where 90% of the generating capacity was coal, gas and nuclear, and when you cut that when you, when you cut back on coal and gas and nuclear, which it ha has been done, basically over the last uh, 10 years, we cut 31 gigawatts of generating capacity from coal, especially coal, but even gas has gone down. And you've replaced it by with 10 and a half gigawatts of wind and solar. And kind of, you know, the obvious, blindingly obvious question, what happens when the wind doesn't blow? You're, you know, you're stumped. It, 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 exactly. And and that's the issue, isn't it? In the, actually, Amazingly, the wind literally uh, hasn't been blowing for, for many weeks now to anything like the uh, the extent predicted. I think it was just down at sort of 2% levels as opposed to 15 or 18% expected. And that's been part of the cause. And, and it's pretty extraordinary to see on the front page of the Sunday Times that we may now be relying on uh, a suggestion that uh, we might need wind farms and solar farms uh, from Morocco to help us in our energy shortage. I mean, seriously, you know, Moroccans can be lovely people, but really, you know, the fifth largest economy in the world having to rely on Moroccan wind uh, to keep the lights on, to keep the power on, to keep the heating on. What's going on, Rupert? This is absolutely crazy talk. I mean, it's just unbelievable that... I mean, batteries at one point were going to save us. And obviously, when you've got, when you've got a wind drought that lasts more than, more than a few hours, uh, you have real... You know, batteries aren't going to cut it. So they're, now they're talking about the, sort of the Moroccan option. I mean, the, the truth is that renewable electricity is extremely expensive. They don't talk about it. So I did some numbers of the big four generating companies, the integrated ones that um, Ofgem supplies figures for. And so for last year, their, their wholesale price that they, they were charging um, energy suppliers was £109 per megawatt hour. And if you compare that to, to coal, gas and so forth, it was £68.54. pence. And what's even worse, Richard, is then you look at the profit margin on that. The profit that they were earning last year was on that £109 they were charging was £54.81p per megawatt hour. That is a 50% profit margin. What? So we, what we've basically been doing is massively over-rewarding um, green energy investors who make, frankly, let's, let's put the cars on, have made out like bandits. The coal, and we've, um, the coal and gas uh, generators have actually been making quite a lot of losses, have, have, have been writing off their stuff, and actually you see Kwasi Kwarteng uh, posing in front of coal-fired power stations being knocked down. 
And so obviously you've got a you've got a, a, a generating capacity mix which doesn't work anymore. Exactly, and you've you've absolutely hit it on the head because so much of our public utilities, in particular the energy generators and the ownership of of all the renewables, huge chunks of that ownership is now owned by overseas investors. I've talked about it before on this show. Uh, you know, a Chinese billionaire being the single biggest owner of our public utilities, making huge profits, making sort of 20% per annum. But it's the same in renewables. And you've got these private equity infrastructure investors. And as you say, they are literally making off like bandits, because this government chose essentially to outsource to private investors, they want a return on their money of about 15% a year, whereas the cost of government money is give or take one or 2%. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why we've ended up in this madness. I touched in my sermon, I don't know if you heard it, about the huge renewable subsidy. Um, I think it's give or take 10 billion a year, Rupert. You might have a, uh, an even more accurate figure. Um, I mean, are, we, are we just consigned to have to accept this? Well, I think there is a huge problem. I mean, what, what we've had is government control, but we've had private sector ownership, and that simply doesn't work. So what the, the government has done is given very, very rich deals to renewable investors, and they've done extremely well. And we, at the same time, government policy has inflicted, um, and this is the other side of the ledger, a, a billion or two billion of losses. I mean, you can go back and you look at the write-offs. In fact, some of the foreign-owned um, utilities have, have absorbed huge losses on their coal-fired power stations. But because the government is in control, it means that you won't get any private sector investment in the gas fired capacity that is the only way in the short term we can that the government can provide energy security that is the only we don't have enough gas gas fired capacity in this country coal's coming offline completely into in three years time yeah and it hasn't been replaced by gas that's okay. the big problem R rupert just um hang on with me until after the news we've got gwyn uh who's calling in it'd be interesting to what his thoughts on this issue uh, Gwyn, I hope think you're on the line. Uh, you've got some yeah. comments on this issue on gas boilers. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Well, yeah, I certainly have, mate. Um, basically, I, I live in a block of flats, and I've been here for six years, and I don't have any gas at all. Uh, we have uh, solar panels, uh, electrically heated, and I've spent no more than about 60 quid since I've been here because of the insulation. Right, so that's so. You, so actually, you're delighted with solar panels, and do you know, um, Gwyn, who put Absolutely. those? Uh, does the block of flats own those solar panels? Who owns them? Well, it's a it's a, it's a council owned property, but um, as I say, it's it's because it's so well well insulated in in the winter. You don't really need to heat on that much. Um, but there's no gas. It's purely solar panels and it's electric. So, so that's and working for say, you, and and therefore absolutely, in a, a, yeah. fantastic. So 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 you're happy. Uh, does that mean you support these characters sitting on the M25, Gwyn? Uh, no, insulate I don't. Britain? I think they're total not an idiot. <laughs> it's a muppet. We're agreed on that, Gwyn. Um, <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Listen, thank you so much for your call. Well, there we are. That's Gwyn there. He's actually benefiting directly from uh, from solar panels. Um, Rupert, are you still there just before yeah. the news? I mean, that's interesting in itself, someone benefiting directly, uh, in a sense, because I guess... Because the, the private invest, the private equity owners, the private equity groups, they've been cut out of that equation in that scenario. Well, the other thing that they benefit from is if you've got a solar panel on your roof, is there is actually a, a, a subsidy from people who don't have solar panels. So you don't, someone with a solar panel on their roof doesn't have their electricity cut off when 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 the sun goes down at night. So they're actually, if you like, free riding on, on the existing grid. And secondly, they have the ability to sell back their excess production um, at a very rich price. So the economics, you know, there's some there's some hidden hidden subsidy in there, and they, as with all of these things, the government made the pricing so that it was attractive for people to put solar panels on their roof, and they've done very well from that. But when you look at the underlying benefit to society, it's much more problematic than those numbers suggest. Indeed, Rupert, we're going to go to the news in a second. Um, stay with us because there's more to talk about that. Uh, we've got some great tweets coming in this uh, coming in. Um, we've got one here. I live in Norway. Our energy bills have also risen by 30% over the summer with a knock-on effect on food prices. 
Uh, this is saying, imagine being one of the main distributors in Europe, and yet we're charged the most. We're, they say, actually, interesting, we're sending too much abroad. You're listening to Tice Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 10.30. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Here are your headlines. I'm Helena Humphrey. Avoiding Christmas chaos, temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are given the go-ahead, but business leaders say it's not enough. And boxing champion Anthony Joshua loses his world titles after being defeated by Alexander Yusik. Government plans to give up to 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas are not enough and barely scratch the surface, according to business leaders. Well, ministers want to avoid disruption in the supply chain in the run-up to Christmas after a shortage of lorry drivers caused problems for petrol stations, supermarkets and fast food chains. This weekend, there have been long queues at four courts across the country. The Labour leader has promised children in England an education fit for the future if he wins power at the next general election. In an interview with a Sunday newspaper, Sir Keir Starmer says he wants to make sure that all pupils leave school ready for work and life and that teaching them practical life skills like planning for a pension or applying for a mortgage will achieve that. He says taxing private schools will pay for it. Voters in Germany will decide who will succeed the long-serving Chancellor Angela Merkel as parliamentary elections take place today. Well, polls are too close to call, which could lead to months of complicated coalition wrangling. However, the election result indicates a closer tie towards the European Union. And Anthony Joshua's reign as heavyweight champion has ended last night after losing to Alexander Yusik at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. Afterwards, Joshua tweeted, Keep positive even if the world is crumbling in front of you. London, I love you. And that's your news on Talk Radio TV. I'll have more coming up in around half an hour's time. <laughs> Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. Don't hesitate to get involved. Give us a call 0344 499 1000. Before the top of our we'll, the hour, we'll also be talking about the NHS capacity as we move towards winter. We've got some great tweets coming in, uh, and one here from Sandra. Regarding energy, can we not make better use of all the hot air coming out from Downing Street? There's plenty of it. I think many of my listeners may agree with you, Sandra. We've still got Rupert Darwell, Senior Fellow of the Real Clear Foundation, on the phone. Rupert, thanks for your thoughts just before the news. Just sort of looking ahead now, Rupert, what impact do you think this energy crisis, this predictable crisis, and these huge increases in bills based on the current scenario what impact do you think this may have on the government's net zero plans as people realise the growing cost of energy? I think the net zero plan is... Um, put, clearly, it puts a big question mark over it. But, Richard, the thing that really, I think, is really worrying about this is when you hear the energy secretaries talking about the, well, the route to energy security is to have more renewables and less... Uh, dispatchable, what uh, people in the energy industry call uh, dispatchable capacity. That is the capacity that actually reacts to demand, that you can turn up and down as people turn on and off their lights. 
if you reduce dispatchable capacity and replace it with um, weather-dependent renewables, you are just digging a deeper hole. And that is where the government is at the moment. It still hasn't realised the cause of this problem. And I think that's, if you like, the, you can call it the curse of COP26, the Glasgow um, uh, climate conference coming up in November. The, the government is absolutely fixated on showing that Britain is this net zero par, you know, paradigm, you know, paradise of net zero. And therefore, it won't look at reality in the face. And that is a big, big problem. And I think the government's going to suffer politically from that. I mean, you, you, we, you could actually make an argument, Rupert, that COP26 is, turns out to be quite well-timed and it's quite handy that it's here in the UK and it's quite handy that it's just before the depths of what no doubt will be a cold winter because it's going to highlight to people the folly of the government's net zero plan. I actually call their plan not net zero. I call it net stupid because it's going to uh, it's going to send hundreds of thousands of decent British jobs overseas. It's going to cost every family hundreds and hundreds of extra pounds every year. And you've just touched on this this extraordinary point. The ministers seem to totally misunderstand the risks of just relying on renewables. Renewables have their pl- part to play, of course in a diverse range of energy sources. But if you're over-reliant on it and the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, then you're so vulnerable to Vladimir just racking up the prices or others. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, and the problem we're going to face is that even if we do get the very expensive gas that uh, Putin's willing to sell us, we won't have enough gas... um, for our power station capacity in the country. It actually felt gas was meant to be this transition fuel to the net zero nirvana. But actually, the, 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 the gas fired capacity has actually fallen over the last 10 years as coal has virtually been eliminated. So we've got a huge, huge problem. And what is absolutely clear is the energy secretary has not a clue how to tackle it. Not a clue. Um, Rupert Darwell, thank you so much for those thoughts, that insight, your experience your knowledge here on this Sunday morning. That was Rupert Darwell of the Real Real Clear Foundation and author of Green Tyranny. Well, the calls are coming in. I want to hear your views on this. And call me also, uh, do you agree, would you frack for cheap shale gas uh, under the the soil of the United Kingdom or or, or not? Would you rather pay more for your energy in order to not to fracking? I want your views, your thoughts on fracking, 0344 499 1000. But we've got a caller here, Mary, from... East Yorkshire. Good morning to you, Mary. What are your thoughts on this energy crisis and this green agenda? Well, I think it could have been avoided. Good morning, Richard. I think it could have been avoided with foresight. I mean, we have resources. We have North Sea resources. We have, we could do shale gas resources. Our coal is the best coal in the world. And they've, a few, uh, or going back 20 years, they were working on a technology that filtered out the um, emissions at the power station so we could have used it. Instead, we were importing coal from Eastern Europe. This is when it was still Warsaw Pact countries. I, I, I just think uh, we've been badly governed for a long time. Badly, but... badly governed. And, and Mary, tell me, have, I mean, are you, re- are you seeing your energy bills going up? Have you received one of those dreaded letters for your, from your oh. energy companies saying that bills are going up this winter? Not so far. Not so far. But, but, but uh, I mean, it's still it's still only um, still only September. Autumn. Yes, exactly. And um, and another thing, I looked up British Gas, which is my provider, and it's not owned by Britain. No. <laughs> but there are so many it's Malaysia. Goodness knows where. Uh, own, own these this things. Is- you're absolutely right, Mary, that, that so much of our utilities, our energy generators and providers now are overseas owned. and They're making a fortune at the expense of uh, the a British, British consumer. consumer. Yeah, yeah, And, and so it sounds to me, you're with me, that you're keen on technology. And I think I'm hearing you're keen on fracking as well, Mary. Yes. I mean, not necessarily in all areas, not, sure. but, but some areas, yes, where all industries were, if there's uh, shale gas there, yes. I'm not. I'm not so keen, maybe, on doing it in the. Um, yes, sure, and, and that, that's fantastic. And I understand that actually fracking technology is improving all the time as well. Mary, thank you so much from East Yorkshire for your thoughts on uh, the concerns that we should use technology in order to be able to uh, use our own 
energy resources because we've got gas in abundance here in the UK. We've got oil in abundance. And yet we've chosen uh, to pay to import energy, to import gas. We've chosen to store our own, uh, to store gas overseas. It's so risky. It's so unnecessary. This is Tice Talk. It is Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Talk radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. 
Welcome back to Ty's Talk on Talk Radio. It is quarter to 11. In this first hour, we've been talking about the energy crisis, how predictable it is, and the impact, the potential impact on the government's climate agenda. Phil's t uh, tweeted in here, Richard, I wish you could bang some heads together in government. They're welcome to frack in my garden. Since I bought low energy bulbs and made other savings, my bills have still gone up. I think many people have that view, but I want your thoughts, your views. Text us, tweet us at Talk Radio. Call us 0344 499 1000. Well, there's many other things to talk about. We've got great guests coming up. After the top of hour, we've got Esther McVeigh. We've got Lord Adonis. We've got uh, Alistair Carmichael from the Liberal Democrats later on in the show. But now we need to talk about uh, the NHS capacity as we move towards winter. And in a sense, I feel that we are learning finally to live with COVID. And there are very few masks now you see everywhere. And I think people are getting on with their lives. The vast, vast majority of people have been double vaccinated. And I think we're making progress. That's the good news. But I was really concerned to read uh, the reports of the significant number of excess deaths since July in the summer from non-COVID related uh, diseases, uh, illnesses. And in a sense, this I think is what's what we call the collateral damage from the lockdowns that so many of us were really worried about. And one of those who spoke up earliest about this was Professor Carol Sikora, consultant oncologist, former chief of the World Health Organization's cancer programme. He spoke up very, very early about the collateral damage in particular uh, for cancer. And I'm delighted that Carol is uh, on the line on Zoom with me this morning. Carol, thanks for joining us. So uh, here we have, we've got figures now uh, from the NHS, from the Office of National Statistics, showing that many thousands of people are dying of uh, in excess numbers uh, from non-COVID illnesses, um, and I guess in particular um, cancers. We're hearing some, some shocking stories. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Is, is this tragically proving you right? Uh, sadly so, and it was sort of predictable but no one wanted to do the prediction. Basically, there are three factors involved. First of all, patient-related factors during the lockdown. People didn't want to leave the house. They certainly didn't want to pitch up in a hospital car park and go inside a hospital. Then there's primary care, general practice. Some of them just shut up shop. Some of them were more accessible. Some of them worked extremely hard, but they were all focused on COVID. So sort of complex symptoms, abdominal pain, weight loss was sort of ignored because it wasn't sort of as urgent. And then thirdly, the whole hospital service, you couldn't get a CT scan, you couldn't get a biopsy of a, a colon tumor and this sort of thing. So the number of cancer patients precipitously fell as soon as we started lockdown. I mean, it was dramatic. Normally there's a thousand new patients a day, Richard. And in, in April last year, it dropped to about 200, which is amazing. And then it gradually picked up since. But but you, you're talking about tens of thousands of people who've been diagnosed late. And and we're hearing these stories of people who are arriving, uh, you know, presenting themselves to doctors, to consultants, and they've already literally gone straight to stage four. I mean, it's you must be hearing this and seeing this yourself. We do. And it's a common theme at the moment. Um, basically, cancer begins in one organ, lung, breast, colon, prostate. And it's usually stage one when it starts, obviously. And if you've got the symptoms, you pick it up. The cure rate for stage one cancer for all of them is about 90%, which is fantastic with modern treatment. But once it spreads to stage two and three, the survival rate drops, the cure rate drops. And that's the problem. And, and, and what should be happening now? Because, you know, we're identifying the problem, but we need to look forward to solutions. And you know, we've got we've got obviously the government sort of is in a sense pouring money billions of pounds in at the the, the top of the NHS, but uh, in terms of the the actual usage of of diagnostics of scanners, uh, usage of the operating theatres, is that changing? I mean, you know, if I was in charge, you know, I'd want everything bluntly to be used pretty much twenty four seven to get on top of this. Uh, this crisis of waiting lists. Do you sense that's, that's, that's beginning to happen or what? No, not yet. I mean, it's sort of happening a little bit. What's needed is proper control of the diagnostic pathway. And at the moment, it's slow. We need to develop centres outside of hospitals 
business parks, wherever, where we have a couple of CT scanners, a couple of MRIs, and an algorithm to follow. We don't need doctors there. We just need patients with certain symptoms. For the, you know, NHS 111 does a good job of triaging people that have a, a problem. Most of the problems are minor, and they can be assured. Some are major, and they get sent in by ambulance. And so we ought to do the same thing for the whole diagnostic pathway. Because if the GPs can't rapidly get people in through the system and you can't book a scan for six months, you're going to miss a lot of cancer before it's too late. So of course. Getting I mean, that's, it done yeah, I get that. That's, that's way too late. And to what extent is the private sector? Uh, what sort of worries me is that you've got a private sector, healthcare sector capacity that's, that's, that's sitting unused at weekends and, and at such times when actually the NHS could be essentially, you know, um, buying that capacity in order to help it with its own, uh, its own challenges, its own waiting lists, its own diagnostics? It's an interesting question, Richard. And last year, Simon Stevens, the, the, the former chief executive of NHS England, developed a plan to use that spare capacity. And uh, it wasn't a bad one. It's sort of been used a little bit, but not fully. I think we're coming into winter now. And we have what we euphemistically call every year winter pressures. And that means operations get cancelled. And remember, there are about 10 million people waiting for some sort of operation. So that's only going to get worse. Winter comes along. Older people get chest infections. They go into hospital. Social services have been whittled away. So it means you can't get them out of hospital, which means you block all the beds. It's not by COVID, but by just chest infections, influenza, and so on, all the problems people get. And that's when we're going to see a new crisis coming. And that's the worry at the moment. Unless we streamline everything, really grab it. And it just, it's not money, ironically. It's streamlining the bureaucracy of I, the NHS. I remember hearing you talk about this before, Carol, where you've said that it's actually, it's not the lack of capacity. It's not the lack of resources. It's the willingness and the, the management skills to organise it, to get it sorted. I, I hate... Uh, waste and incompetence it, it literally drives me bonkers uh, you know when it's there I'm not interested in the ideology and, and and from what I understand patients actually don't care who you know who does the treatment where it's done uh, they just want the pain the suffering the agony to go as quickly as possible uh, how do we get how do we get more use of the uh, the private healthcare capacity uh, to get on top of these issues the, the key is partnership, public-private partnerships. The WHO like to talk about them. Uh, the idea you have private sector with capital, with new ways of working, innovation, customer care, and you've got the public sector, which on the whole is poor at customer care. And just look at, we have all this technology to book an airline ticket. You try and book an NHS appointment on your mobile phone, you'll struggle. Even you, Richard, you <laughs> are very good at technology, will struggle, I guarantee you. Uh, and you, you can book a ticket to New York tomorrow on your phone right now. Uh, and that, that's the weakness in the system. We're not customer friendly. We don't care about people's time. You know, there's no reason for people have chemotherapy. They need to spend all day in the hospital. They can have it in half an hour, be back in their car in 45 minutes afterwards. Sure, if they want to cough, if they want to talk, that's fine. But sure. most of them don't want to get on with their lives. And that's important. Absolutely. Um, Carol Sor Ka Professor Carol Sakura, thank you so much for those thoughts. Consultant oncologist. And that's exactly where I'm at. You know, I think that the patient should be put first. The patient is the boss, not the bureaucratic monopoly provider. And actually, customer service is absolutely key. And if the patient was in charge, and I'm going to have some thoughts about that and be talking about that uh, next Sunday when we'll be broadcasting from Manchester, where I'm also giving a speech at a conference of a certain political party. So uh, those are Carol Sakura's thoughts. Call us 0344 499 1000. If you've got experience of trying to get hospital uh, attendance, trying to get diagnostics, scans, are you on a waiting list somewhere? Uh, what would you like to see? What are your solutions? Give us a call. I'm delighted we've got Paul from Christchurch, who's got some thoughts on the panic about shortages. Paul, good morning. Hi, good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, fine, thanks. What are your experiences? What are your thoughts on... Uh, well, my thought... Sorry, my thoughts on the fuel thing. Um, the government announced that there's uh, no need to panic about fuel, um, which, being on the media, creates panic. Um, same with climate crisis, same with um, pandemic. I know that exists. 
Um, I think they create in crisis using the mainstream media to, to divide people almost. And second thought is about the um, uh, doctors thing. I can't get an appointment. I can't even get through to... Um, so I've lost faith in the NHS, so I don't even bother. I mean, that, that's, that, that's so sad because, in a sense, um, you know, you need... If you need to see a doctor, then you need to see a doctor. And we're hearing this, you know, up and down the country. Uh, oh, yeah. Anecdotes all over the place, Paul. You know, it really is so serious. I think you're right. And interestingly, Paul, I mean, there's a... Um, uh, there's a tweet here talking about energy uh, from, I can't quite see who it's from, from Hook, saying, why is no one talking about wave power? We live on an island, we're surrounded by totally reliable tidal movement, regardless of the weather. Um, do you think we should be using more hydropower, Paul? Um, wave power, I think, is probably uh, more reliable than wind and solar, obviously, because our weather. Um, but again, you're going to have some environmental impact with wave power, um, building the infrastructure and fishing and, and stuff like that. I don't know quite, I'm not quite a scientist, I don't know quite how that works. No, well, I, I mean, I, I think, see, the, there is actually a scheme that was talked about that this Conservative government uh, was going, had given permission for, called the Swansea Bay Lagoon, which was a huge uh, tidal power scheme which would create uh, a massive amount, hundreds, thousands of jobs. Uh, in South Wales uh, and would have been very predictable power. And I think that actually we should have done that because it's about creating diverse energy sources and we would learn from it. And we can be a world leader in new technology. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure the Conservatives would do that. And uh, as far as politics go, don't get me started. But um, <laughs> who's promoting this? Which company? And, and where do I buy the shares in it? Well, um, uh, that I can't answer because I, I genuinely don't know. But Paul from Christchurch, thank you so much for your thoughts. I think we do need a range of energy sources. We do need to invest in new technologies. And we need to use the government's balance sheet in order to do this. And I'll be talking about this again and again, because at the moment, far too often, British consumers are being ripped off by private equity groups, overseas owned. Uh, they're looking for high returns, and it's the British consumer pays. You're listening to Tice Talk here at the home of common sense. It's Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him, for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at 11, I'm Helena Humphrey. Avoiding Christmas chaos, temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are given the go-ahead, but business leaders say it is not enough. A 38-year-old man is arrested on suspicion of the murder of school teacher Sabina Nessa in what police call a significant development. And boxing champion Anthony Joshua loses his world titles after being defeated by Alexander Yusik. Government plans to give up to 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas are not enough and barely scratch the surface, according to business leaders. While ministers want to avoid disruption to the supply chain in the run-up to Christmas after a shortage of lorry drivers caused problems for petrol stations, supermarkets and fast food chains. This weekend, there have been long queues at four ports across the country. Labour leader Sakir Starmer slammed the government's response to what he calls a crisis. And I'm astonished that the government, knowing the situation, is not acting today. The Prime Minister needs to say today what he's going to do. There are 100,000 vacancies for drivers. There are shortages. I went up the road here out of Brighton yesterday. Right. There are three petrol stations, one of them with a massive queue, two of them with signs saying no fuel. Police have arrested a 38-year-old man on suspicion of murdering Sabina Nessa, calling it a significant development in the investigation. The man was apprehended at an address in East Sussex at around 3 a.m. this morning. Sabina Nessa, a 28-year-old primary school teacher, was murdered while walking through a park in south-east London just over a week ago. Three people have died and more than 50 others have been injured after a train derailed in the U.S. state of Montana. Several carriages on an Empire Builder service came off the tracks at 4 o'clock local time. 141 passengers and 16 crew members were on board at the time. Voters in Germany will decide who will succeed the long-serving Chancellor Angela Merkel as parliamentary elections take place today. Will polls are too close to call, which could lead to months of complicated coalition wrangling. However, the election result could indicate a closer tie towards the European Union. Berlin will become even more focused on Brussels and on the European Union, especially if the next Chancellor is Olaf Scholz, who's the current uh, finance minister and who's... Uh, polling best currently in, in the polls. He has already announced that he wants to have more integration in the European Union. And Anthony Joshua's reign as world heavyweight champion was ended last night after losing to Alexander Usyk at Tottenham Hotspur, Hotspur Stadium. Excuse me, the Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. Taking a look at your weather now, turning cooler and more unsettled today with wet and windy weather on its way. And that's your live news on Talk Radio TV. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 11.04. We're into the second hour. We've been talking throughout my show mainly about the predictability of the energy crisis, what we should be doing about it, and how people feel about, for example, using the abundant supplies of cheap energy, cheap gas that we have here in the UK, rather than paying lots of money overseas for expensive gas. We've got Phil here who tweeted in, Richard, we're a nuclear power with coal reserves, vast shale gas reserves. We've some of the largest tidal ranges in the world. There's no excuse for the energy crisis other than 25 years of government incompetence. I have to say, I really do agree. Rupert Darwell, uh, he agreed earlier in the show, and I'm delighted now uh, to talk about this a bit more, is uh, Esther McVeigh, MP, former cabinet minister uh, in Theresa May's government during the, the Brexit dramas, a former leadership contender in 2019. And I have to say, 
uh, judging by some of the uh, the comments and tweets coming in, I think many of my listeners might rather Esther was in charge than uh, the current Prime Minister. But anyway, uh, Esther, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, oh, morning, Richard. Thank good you morning. Uh, great to see you and really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Goodness me, um, the, the, the dramas are piling up on the government. They really do need a firm tiller and some strong leadership. Um, where are you at in terms of this energy crisis? Uh, you know, you've been a, a strong, outspoken critic in a very principled way of many issues. Uh, what are your thoughts on where we are? And I'd be interested in your thoughts on where you are and your constituents' views on fracking, given that I think you are, uh, your constituency is above the Bolan Shale. Well, I think you are now at the helm of this debate we should have been having for a long time. And that is, what do we need to ensure that we've got a reliable, affordable, uh, secure supply of energy? And for just far too long, what we've had uh, is a debate on decarbonisation and going green. And whilst that, you know, is a positive argument to have, how do we get there? How do we make it greener? What are the new industries? What is the way the world is going? You still have to ensure that you have got a reliable, affordable energy source. And that now is coming into clear focus when we're saying, where are we getting our energy from? How much have we got? Are we, uh, uh, you know, who are we reliant on around the world and what sources are we re uh, reliant on? So I think this debate now, unfortunately, it's come at a crunch point, but we need to have that. And, and in a sense, in the nicest possible way, I don't want to rely on anybody else, but our own energy sources, our own energy reserves, our own tidal power, um, in order to create uh, cheap, abundant, reliable, affordable energy for uh, for all of us in the UK. And it's only literally, um, Esther, four years since in the 2017 Conservative Manifesto, uh, where fracking was going to be and, and the use of cheap shale gas uh, was, was going to drive uh, tens of thousands of jobs. It was going to be part of the solution. Um, and that very quickly, with just a few sort of what I call eco-bullies and zealots um, whinging and complaining, yeah. all of a sudden that just got ditched. Uh, and as I said, what you frequently see, and this is what we've seen, is sort of big rhetoric, big um, global um, meetings of... Uh, parliamentarians from around the world at G20, G7, all wanting to make great declarations going forward. We will be green by this date. We will be net zero by this date. They set it probably at a date that they will never be there. But what we didn't do was have that debate. How do we get there for each country? What is possible? What isn't? And that really is what we've got to do. So you're quite right we could have and should have not only done more and got done that extra research and followed maybe what the americans did on fracking i know at the time it was about 2019 people were concerned with uh, you know uh, pure water would there be contamination into the water supplies and of course we had to address that and if the research wasn't up to date of course we wouldn't have done it right then but what we shouldn't have done is stop it all together exactly. and say we won't do let's instead make ourselves more reliable on you know other sources which wasn't in our control so we didn't do that in 2019 for what you know as you say for whatever reason uh and then we also didn't pursue on the nuclear path that we were meant to go so what have we got now is seven nuclear sort of reactors which in the course of the next decade will uh, be uh, coming out of use and service. So we've got 20% thereabouts on nuclear, and that will halve. So in every way, we've got to look, what uh, have we got? What absolutely. We so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted you raised the nuclear point, because it's going to come on to that. Because you know we are building a new power station at Hinkley Point. I touched in my Sunday sermon uh, earlier this morning, the fact that um, that was being financed with billions of pounds of Chinese state money, which I, I have to say I feel very uncomfortable with, and then suggestions that Sizewell and Bradwell um, 
uh, could also be literally designed and operated by the Chinese uh, you know, nuclear power generation company. Are you comfortable with that? Because I have to say, Esther, I'm not at all. So this has been going on for some time, these discussions, and it was signed off, I think it was 2016 under Theresa May uh, to get the Hinkley point. Um, but since then, we have seen what would we call it a muscular China, China extending their reach in many ways, and people have only come alert to that fact in the last couple of years. So we've seen a sort of change there. Equally, you say that China uh, could be happy to uh, uh, carry on at Hinkley Point, but they're told if they're gonna be forced out of uh, Sizewell and Bradwell, they may pull out of that altogether. So again, you've got to look, where are you getting your money to go forward uh, with that? So we're at at a very precarious uh, time in our history on sort of energy resources. Sure. And like you, sure. I look at sort of what America did with fracking. They were a net importer of 15%. When they um, looked at how to use the fracking, the natural gas uh, in their country, they're now a net exporter. And we would have those capabilities. And I just think, yes, if it's not safe, you wouldn't pursue it. But let's do that extra sort of research to make sure that we are. Indeed, I may have just lost you there, Esther. But also, and it's interesting you raised the point about where are the billions going to come from? Well, the truth is, I'm, I'm a great believer in what I call a win-win solution where you have private sector expertise, but actually the cheapest finance for long-term critical national infrastructure is, of course, um, using the government's balance sheet rather than uh, outsourcing uh, that to private uh, private equity groups that are looking for huge returns uh, as opposed to the much lower cost government money. And there's some interesting reports in the, uh, I think in the Sunday Times today, that actually the government is now looking at uh, investing alongside uh, and helping Rolls-Royce, uh, a great British company, a great British brand, uh, because they've got some world leading technology in smaller much faster to build, much cheaper to build uh, nuclear reactors called small modular reactors. So I'm a great fan that we should be advancing that and accelerating that. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Esther? Yeah, and, and some people have been championing that for a long time. People like uh, Lord Lilly has been championing that. And I've been saying, why don't we do that? As you say, they are cheaper, they are smaller, they are more local. And that could be uh, the, the, the way forward and it could be a win-win either way. But we've got to now have all of these ideas on the table and we should have for a long period of time because it won't be just one energy source. We'll no doubt need a multiple of energy sources, different things that we can do. And I think that was the problem as we looked at um, renewables, the solar and the wind, and we've had that increase as a percentage share of our energy, but people at the time said it wasn't reliable, which is exactly. what we've got now in September with a, a hardly any wind, but we were really reliant on that. And then what did we have? We had to bring in, uh, you know, liquid um, uh, gas from whether it's Russia, whether it's Norway, whether it's Denmark, and we made ourselves very vulnerable to other sort of conditions. And that's why I think um, we've got to move on and we can become more self-sustainable. I, I agree, Esther. I want to move on, please, to a couple of other issues because um, you voted uh, against the government uh, against many of the lockdown rules on, on multiple occasions, because I, I think you were concerned, as I was, about the collateral damage from uh, lockdowns, uh, all the other uh, health issues that non-COVID health issues people uh, may have. Um, we had Car Professor Carol Sakura, oncologist, on just before uh, the uh, the top of the hour. Um, do you fear that your worst fears are being played out now in terms of the non-COVID uh, issues that we're seeing, the deaths, the, the huge, uh, huge waiting lists that we're seeing uh, on some of these illnesses? I have always said, and I wrote a long time ago, there is a cost of COVID, there is also a cost of lockdown. And when you fundamentally close your country down for 18 months, there is a cost. As you said, you had a 
uh, Professor Carol uh, Sikora on earlier, very much talking about the health issues, whether that's cancer, whether that's mental health. But equally, you have it on poverty, loss of jobs. There is a whole host of things. And actually, as we talk about the energy crisis now, what we saw was this infrastructure, the nuclear power stations, et cetera, not having the maintenance. A lot of that was COVID uh, related to. So we're seeing it across the board. When you close a country down, what happens? You haven't got that regular maintenance across the board. And this was some of the issues. So what I'd said was, let's look at it in the round. Of course, the scientists uh, and the medical people focused on that COVID issue, that immediate COVID issue, but we as politicians should have looked in the round, the full 360 degrees, and what would that mean? And then when we had the uh, vaccination come along, we could have come out even you know, quicker. Of, of course. Um, I think we're so right. Uh, my sense is that the the people, the country wouldn't accept further lockdowns. I think uh, I, I'm heartened that actually people are uh, beginning to realise that we do have to live with this. Um, before we let you go, uh, Esther, you were obviously a very principled Brexiteer like myself. We have got this issue of uh, the, which is essentially a global shortage of lorry drivers, uh, not only just here in the UK, but across Europe and elsewhere, we understand. So the government said, um, literally until I think literally this weekend that they weren't going to extend short term uh, working visas for EU lorry drivers who may or may not be available. Um, but now they seem to have, have you turned completely and said they will grant them until Christmas. Um, where are you as a Brexiteer uh, on this? Would you would you be if you were in charge, if you had won that leadership election, would you be granting short term visas or would you be saying no, actually uh, let the market talk, pay more to the lorry drivers? Look, this is another issue as well from lockdown. 40,000 people never had their tests. Other thousands of people haven't got their licenses through. So there was a lot gone on. Now, some Brexiteers would say, look, we, we wanted to take back control and take back control doesn't necessarily mean closing your borders. But what I would like to see, because obviously there is an issue for uh, lorry drivers, it has been for a long period of time. And it is about their work. It is about their conditions. It is about sort of the 24 seven sort of eight 18 hour or, or you well, it's a 24 seven world within, within which they work. And we've never addressed that. So this has happened over a long, long period of time. And as you rightly say, there is a shortage. I don't know where they're getting them in Europe. There is a significant shortage of drivers in Europe. There is a significant shortage of drivers in America too. It is actually about that job and probably conditions uh, there, but I would like to see sort of British jobs for British workers, and let's see what we can do to get some of those people who should have Indeed. their license now, who should have had their tests to be uh, so, working. But it's going to take a, a, a long time to solve this. It's not going to be done over the weekend, is it? So that sounds like a no to me. You wouldn't be granting the visas short term. I, well, we've left ourselves in such a tricky situation right now. Uh, we're going to have to do all we can do. But, it, you know, if those jobs aren't there, we're sort of saying something. We're going to grant visas, but actually, the, is anybody coming forward for them? Um, so, so uh, as I said, I believe that we're in control of what we do. If we do need people, I guess we're going to have to uh, reach out. But uh, we've left it as, I'm mm -hmm. afraid, politics to me is becoming incredibly myopic and we're constantly firefighting and not looking at five, ten year blocks of time where we get in place uh, proper methods to which we solve problems, which is exactly what we've done with the energy, let alone the drivers. Um, Esther, thank you so much. Uh, could you have a word in the show-like ear of the Prime Minister to have some forward-looking leadership, please? That was Esther McVeigh, uh, Conservative MP for Tatton, with her thoughts on where we are. The time is 11.19. You're listening to Tice Talk here on Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ties Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 11.23, and later on in the hour, we've got Lord Andrew Adonis talking about the Labour Party and the conference. We've got some great tweets coming in. Wonderful one here from David. Simple. Uh, why can't we build our own nuclear power plants? What's wrong with us? It's a really good question, David. And uh, we've got another one here from Flo. I live just down the road from Hinkley Point, where, bu- where they are building, uh, but using uh, EDF, the French company, and using Chinese money. Um, she's saying that uh, there is a massive investment in infrastructure, boosting local trade and employment because of that. The town was dying a slow death beforehand. That's great. I'm a fan of building the latest, newest, most technologically advanced, small modular nuclear reactors. That is the way forward. But I think we should be doing it using our own expertise, our own government's balance sheet, and not outsourcing it all to overseas investors who make huge, huge returns. We've got some callers with their views. Barry in Norwich, good morning to you. Uh, What are your thoughts on the energy crisis, climate change? Well, I think uh, this country seems to be lurching from one crisis to another. Yeah, that's all you hear on the news. Uh, a, a fuel crisis, a social care crisis, and it's just one crisis to another. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, with the truck crisis at the moment, you know, we've, 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 we've had plenty of time to train people up. We've, we left Europe in 2016, didn't we? Yeah, it's now 2021. That's right. They, think, just, they just stopped yeah. testing people last year. So there was sort of 40, it was a 40,000 driver shortage, a, a lack of testing. Yeah, we could have tested them before the crisis. Of you know, course. We left, we, we, yeah, you know, we, 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 they've had plenty of time to do this. But I think what it is now is, like me personally... I've been in my job for the last 23 years, right? Now, I can tell you now, after 2004, when Tony Blair opened the doors up, yeah, right, to various different countries coming in, I now work for £6 an hour less than I did in 1998, right? And it's now 2021, okay? So Uh, so you essentially, and I think that's the rub of it, you basically uh, essentially saw a freezing of your your wages. Yeah, uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, that's. I think people, millions of people, saw that across the board, and that's what I view as one of the Brexit dividends now, Barry, is that yeah. actually uh, wages are beginning to go up, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing, yeah. That's a good thing, but I think now because we're so re- this country is so reliant on everything from, from this gas, electricity. We're reliant. I mean, you saw the French going to Guernsey not so long back, threatening to cut the electricity off in Guernsey, didn't you? You know, we, we, we should frack in this country. America America are fracking. You know, we, we, we are so reliant on other countries for our stuff. Do you, you know what I mean? I, I, I agree entirely. So, so Barry, it sounds like you're pro-fracking. We had Esther McVeigh on, the MP for Tatton, yeah. which is above uh, where, what's called the Boland Shale, where there is over some give or take 50 years' worth of yeah. cheap, accessible gas, our own gas. So, Barry, thank you so much for that. It sounds like you're with me. We need to be more self-reliant. Uh, we need to be more willing to stand up to the eco-zealots that basically force the Conservative government to bottle it on our own shale gas. I think we've got Daniel from Surrey uh, with some thoughts. Daniel, good morning. Where are you this morning? What are your thoughts this morning? I'll tell you what, if you take a step back, Richard, I'm, I'm looking at it now. We've got all the, we've got the fuel crisis, the HGV crisis. We've... Law and order's never been worse. People getting stabbed and shot on a daily basis. We've got parts of the economy still stifled. Um, you know, you, you've got, we're basically being invaded by sea on a daily basis from the third world. And I just want the government that I voted for, I want the tough right of centre government that was going to act and do things, and I haven't got that. And I'll give, you, I'll give you a perfect example of it. All these different protest groups that keep taking over the roads, Richard, right? If you went in and you CS sprayed every single one of them and you used baton and all of them got a large fine, it wouldn't happen ever again. But because the police don't really police anymore, it's happening more regularly all the time because people get away with it. That's right. I mean, it's essentially, uh, you know, wet, feeble leadership from the police, some of whom were sort of asking the protesters whilst they were sitting down if everything was all right, if they had any questions. I think they have got better. But I'm with you, uh, Daniel. I, I think most people... Uh, would say actually, you know, they really they, some of these people they need a good slap around the face 
uh, and taught the facts of life because it really is, uh, you know, and it's outrageous. Do. Yes, we support the right to protest, but that does not include the right to disrupt, the right to obstruct, the right to prevent people getting to hospital or to earn a living. And Richard, where's our prime minister while Rome's burning? He's in America talking about green issues again. You know, but he's talking about the thing that not one conservative asked him to. We didn't vote for it. We didn't ask him to talk about it. But he's over there again talking about green issues while Rome's burning at home. And I tell you what, I want Boris out. I what? want this entire, I want his entire cabinet out, and I want some real tough, proper conservatives to run this party because on the, we've had enough, Richard. This is. I've had enough of it, personally. I, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, I, I can hear the frustration in your voice, Daniel. I'm quite sure you didn't vote for Boris to go to uh, go to America to talk about Kermit the Frog. Exactly. I'm not, not being funny. We've got so many problems, right? If we lived in Utopia and law and order and immigration was all, we was fine. But we don't we and we never will. Yeah, and if that was, then we could talk about green issues. They'd be at the top of the agenda, but they're not. They're about 25th of priorities for most British people. And right, he's got right. to go. He's, so, he's got so to go. In, in a word, Daniel, who do you think in the Conservative Party is strong enough, tough enough for you? I just think root and branch, these upper middle class, limp wristed sort of civil servants and the, the cabinet, they've all got to go and they've got to realise that that's not what we voted or asked for. Yeah, well, that, we, there you are. Um, Daniel, we, thank we, you so much. That's Daniel from Surrey with his, uh, his concerns, uh, his anxieties. But interestingly, uh, it doesn't seem quite obvious to Daniel as to who is the person that he wants, who's the person that he would support. Well, give me your views, your thoughts. 0344 499 1000. The time is 11.30. This is Ty's Talk at the home of Common Sense, Talk Radio. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Here are your headlines. I'm Helena Humphrey. Avoiding Christmas chaos, temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are given the go-ahead, but business leaders say it is not enough. And a 38-year-old man's arrested on suspicion of the murder of schoolteacher Sabina Nessa in what police call a significant development. Government plans to give up to 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas are not enough and barely scratch the surface, according to business leaders. Well, ministers want to avoid disruption to the supply chain in the run-up to Christmas after a shortage of lorry drivers caused problems for petrol station supermarkets and fast food chains. This weekend, there have been long queues at four courts across the country. Labour leader Sakir Starmer slammed the government's response to what he calls a crisis. And I'm astonished that the government, knowing the situation, is not acting today. The Prime Minister needs to say today what he's going to do. There are 100,000 vacancies for drivers. There are shortages. I went up the road here out of Brighton yesterday. Right. There are three petrol stations, one of them with a massive queue, two of them with signs saying no fuel. Police have arrested a 38-year-old man on suspicion of murdering Sabina Nessa, calling it a significant development in the investigation. The man was apprehended at an address in East Sussex at around 3 a.m. this morning. Sabina Nessa, a 28-year-old primary school teacher, was murdered while walking through a park in south-east London just over a week ago. And Anthony Joshua's reign as world heavyweight champion was ended last night after losing to Alexander Yusik at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. And that's your news on Talk Radio TV. I'll have more coming up in around half an hour's time. This 
is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 11.33 and we have had a busy morning. We've been talking about the energy crisis, how predictable it was, how we can get cheap energy, our own energy, our own gas. Should we frack or not frack? And so far, the views from callers and from the tweets is yes, we should be using our own gas literally uh, under our own uh, soil, our own land. Uh, I've had a tweet in here from here, someone just clarifying that Tatton is nowhere near the trough of Boland. That's correct. But what's called the Boland Shale, as I understand from the maps I've seen and looked at, actually is a huge, huge area uh, across a massive chunk uh, north and south of the Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, that, that whole swathe uh, across, uh, across northern England. Uh, we've got lots of tweets coming in. We've got one here saying, I've cancelled my membership of the Conservative Party, my direct debit. Uh, another one here saying he's shoulder to shoulder with the last caller, Daniel. And, um, ah, now Karen says, I think Ian Duncan Smith should lead a proper Brexiteer and great on COVID. Uh, not sure about his fuel policy. But actually, that's an interesting point that you've got a, a really experienced, strong, principled uh, individual there who's nowhere near the cabinet, uh, who's essentially wasted on the bank benches. Um, we've got a, a tweet here. Peter says, we no longer have a police force. We have a police service and they're only in service of uh, the woke. Uh, we no longer have policing for the majority of this country. I think there are real concerns. You know, we, we, we support the, the brave officers on the front line, but I think it's a question of leadership. I really do. We need leadership in so many areas of uh, the institutions and cabinet uh, and the prime minister that I think we're lacking. But one thing's for sure, my next uh, guest, Lord Adonis, chair of the European movement, he was part of um, you know, some really big beasts, a cabinet of big beasts under Tony Blair uh, some 15 years ago. Andrew, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm not sure. Are you in Brighton with... Uh, I've with just Labour? arrived in Brighton. You've I just arrived in Brighton. The, of the seaside it, and the Labour Party conference. Is the, is the sun shining? Because it's pretty gloomy no. here in London, Andrew. No, the sun never shines at party conferences, oh dear, as, oh dear. As, you, as, you, as you well know. Well, I must uh, confess... It's meant to be endured, not to, not to be enjoyed. In fairness, Andrew, I, 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 it may surprise you to know that I've never been to a Labour Party conference, but I do need to ask you... Um, I do need to ask, have you read and learnt by heart the 13,000 word um, essay by Sir Keir, uh, about the future? Uh, I've read it. I'm afraid I haven't learnt it by heart. But uh, I think it, in its own terms, it's a perfectly good uh, pamphlet. I like this idea of the contribution of society that people should be expected to put in. You know, this is JFK. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I think that sort of is a very broad and socially uniting theme. But, of course, um, we're in the middle of a lot of challenges facing the country. And whilst uh, we, ab we absolutely are. big ideas are good, uh, and therefore, you know, with addressing the, the problems is in, good too. Indeed. And so whilst, whilst we, we agree we've got lots of challenges, Andrew, um, it seems that uh, Sir Keir Starmer was focusing quite a lot on sort of what I would call um, boring electoral process, which hasn't gone so well for him, rather than actually uh, grabbing people's attention with some solutions to the challenges you know, how you're going to deal with the energy, how we're going to get cheaper energy for tens of millions of people up and down the country and how we're going to get the economy growing again. Uh, well, I, I agree with that. I, I myself don't think it's much, uh, uh, there's much point in spending your time on internal constitutional matters. I don't think people are much concerned about the precise process by which the Labour Party leader is elected. They just want a good leader and they want them to start providing solutions. And you're right, energy is one, but of course the equally pressing one is this big shortage of lorry drivers. Ah, yes, I thought you might moment. come on to that. And, uh, and I, I'm strongly, you know, I mean, you and I had a big disagreement about Brexit, but whatever your view on some of the underlying causes, obviously it's right to be seeing lots of, of visas and encouraging people to come and actually get the trucks moving because it's in no one's interests that we have empty supermarkets and uh, fuel stations that are having to be closed because of partly a for lack sure of delivery, for sure but also and i think because of panic buying because people think that there may be a big shortage in the future it, indeed i think there's a real question because whenever the government says don't panic of course because we can't trust a single word this government says because they've been flip-flopping around um uh, one almost believes exactly the opposite but um 
And you, you obviously think that uh, if you issue some visas, there would be some lorry drivers who might come from across the EU. But, but as we understand and read, Andrew, actually, this lorry driver shortage is it's almost global. It's certainly Europe wide. Um, yeah, but I can't say but it's important to separate the ideology here. There are a lot of people who have a lot of views on on whether or not it's um, a good idea to have uh, international lorry drivers coming here. And I respect those views, but we're in the middle of a crisis at the moment. And so what is the argument against making a large number of visas available? Indeed, because of, of changes that are being made consequential on Brexit, people are going to have to show passports, drivers a whole lot more bureaucracy and red tape that didn't exist before. The right thing to do in what's becoming a national emergency is to strip away the red tape, welcome people here. We don't know how many will come, and there'll be other things that need to be done too. They, for example, should get on rapidly with conducting more tests. Well, I mean, exactly. A massive see... backlog of tests, all kinds of things. But what you should do in a crisis, which I think you probably agree, Richard, is you should fire on all cylinders. Uh, definitely. You should I, do I, all I, of the things that you can I, do I agree to with, get the country moving. I agree with firing all, all cylinders. I agree with pragmatic solutions. I think you and I are agreed on that. Um, I think there, there, there is a testing crisis. You've got to remove some of the red tape. I just think that um, the big business lobby groups uh, have played this uh, this lorry driver shortage, the uh, loss of EU uh, drivers. Um, I think they've played that hand. Probably they've played it quite well, but I fear that temporary visas would turn out to be long-term visas. And I, I rather like the idea, Andrew, that British drivers are earning lots more um, every hour, every week. Yeah, but I don't like the idea of empty supermarkets and panics in fuel stations. And I don't actually think that the, the lower drivers themselves like that. What we obviously need is a country that works. I want to see uh, higher pay for truck drivers and other people who've been on low pay. That's completely right. I want to see a much higher minimum wage. I think we should be addressing all these questions. But when you're in the middle of um, a whirlwind, as we are at the moment, you should try and... and and stop the damage being done. So, and, Andrew, would you would uh, you not would in you, anyone's interest? No. To have so, would you would you support, for example, bringing in some of the uh, army logistics drivers to help, either whether it's with fuel or whether it's with the supermarkets? You know, we've got some fantastic committed service men and women who could help. Yes, I strongly support it. Obviously, it's firing on all cylinders means using all of the professional support you've got. And as you say, you've got lots of logistics people in the armed forces who could help. So I completely agree with that. As I agree with uh, accelerating the tests. I agree with recruiting more testers. We should be expanding our testing facilities at the moment. And I agree with a lot of, of temporary visas and waving red, you know, red tape, which at the moment is stopping EU drivers from coming here. We should do the lot so that we're, we're not in a panic situation which is gripping the country at the moment absolutely and I, I read with some sort of horror whether it's true or not that um uh, some of the testing examiners uh were thinking of going on strike because they're asked to do more tests per day uh I, I, where are you on that uh, that sort of nonsense I, I i wasn't aware of that but that would be a very irresponsible thing to do again when we're in a national crisis you do expect people you know all to come together and do their bits and that certainly uh, would be very inappropriate. So I very much hope that doesn't happen. And, and, and what's uh, what's the key thing, Andrew? You want to hear from uh, Sir Keir Starmer when he gives his leader speech uh, in uh, in this conference. What what Keir has got to do is offer a, a very clear plan to get the country moving again. The country, partly because of COVID, for reasons beyond the control of any of us, has literally stopped. I mean, it's had a kind of of a heart attack over the, over the last 18 months. So obviously it's recovering from that is important, but we've got a lot of other things going on too, including I'm afraid the consequences of Brexit. And what he needs is a clear plan for investment, for jobs, uh, for getting people into uh, productive employment. You know, for example, young people at the moment coming out of schools and colleges this year, there's been a fall in the number of apprenticeships, a fall. I mean, that is an absolutely criminal state of affairs and Madness. he needs a clear plan for getting things moving and I think the public would respond to that. What he doesn't want is the Labour Party looking inwards and still some of the crazy things, you know, calling Tories scum, which one of the senior Labour person did. That's reprehensible. That shouldn't be happening. All this talk about mass nationalisation. Can you imagine what Middle England thinks about spending hundreds of billions of pounds on owning things which we could regulate better anyway? We've got to focus on the things that really matter to the country and not a lot of this ideological and name-calling nonsense. Well, Andrew, um, uh, it'll be interesting whether we hear that. Um, if you want to hear uh, some other solutions for getting the country moving, getting the country growing, then uh, I'll be putting forward my solutions next Sunday uh, around lunchtime in Manchester.
uh, at uh, at another party conference. Um, thank you, Andrew, for your thoughts. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, speaking to us from the Labour conference in Brighton. Well, you're listening to Ty's Talk. Uh, that was Lord Adonis with his thoughts. Uh, this is, of course, the home of common sense. We welcome views from all sides. We agree with some. We don't agree with others. But we have a respectful, positive, constructive debate. The time's 11.43, and this is Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here in Talk Radio Towers. It's Talk Radio. The time is 11.48. We've just been speaking to Lord Andrew Adonis down at Brighton at the Labour Party conference with his thoughts. And that's got you going on Twitter, it's fair to say. Uh, we've got one here from the uh, the Lincolnshire Poacher who says Andrew Adonis is priceless, just saying he's all in favour of British workers getting higher wages when it was him and the Blair government who opened the floodgates to... Uh, cheap European labour. Does he not get the irony? Another one here from Social Care who says, uh, re Lord Adonis, you can't support freedom of movement and also call for higher minimum wage. The former negates the need for the latter. So uh, people's thoughts uh, pretty clear there. I think actually what we are seeing is uh, wages, um, hourly wages for amongst the lowest paid in our country going up. I think that's a great thing. I think you know the lorry drivers, for example, they've been uh, they've, they've suffered bad working conditions. Uh, they've essentially been sort of taken for granted by many of the supermarkets of big business, and now actually the negotiating leverage is on the other foot. Well, our caller here now, our next caller is from Exeter, is Mike, who I think uh, is involved in uh, the lorry driving business. Mike, a very good. It is still just good morning to you. Uh, what are your thoughts? Hi, like Richard. Yeah. Um, first of all, there's a lot of things that I've been talked about, which is quite important about the short why the reason for shortage of drivers. First thing is the thing called the CPC, the uh, Certificate of Professional Competence. Uh, and every five years or during a five-year period, each driver has to do 35 hours of training. It's brought in by the EU. Okay, and it's just a nonsense, really. It's, it's what people do on a daily basis, but it has to be formalised and you have to have a card. Without that card, you cannot drive commercially. So there's a lot of people out there that have got licences can't drive commercially. So the idea of bringing in the military, I don't see how they're going to drive because they're not technically allowed to drive commercially. I suppose the government will say, well, they don't need to because it's an emergency. So why... That's the case. Why can't we not suspend the CPC? Uh, so that's the first thing. So, okay, now that's interesting, Mike. So you're essentially saying there's lots of red tape which is getting in the way of keeping drivers on the road, of getting drivers back onto the road. Uh, that that is frustrating. I mean, I hate red tape. It drives me bonkers. Um, uh, is that right? And is there anything else that's holding it back, causing these shortages? Well, that is the first thing. So that be done in five years or during the five year period. But don't forget we've had lockdowns on and off for eighteen months. So a lot of those courses, a lot of those drivers haven't been able to do these courses. Yeah. Um, they also don't forget a lot of companies, but some the bigger companies will pay for it for the driver and pay them while they're doing it. But small independent people, small drivers on their own, they have to take a day off work and they have to then pay for the course of the losing about two hundred pounds a day. So yeah. that's that's that that's that sort of Sure, I get I, I get that, Mike. I mean, that, that uh, you know, red tape, uh, that unnecessary uh, certificate of professional competence. You know, if you can't get the testing, if you can't get those hours, then clearly uh, that's going to send you to go and do something else. Um, in the interest of time and other callers, Mike, um, I'm going to have to thank you and leave it there and move on because we have got uh, Paul from Wapping who's got some thoughts on uh, the fracking industry. Paul, a good morning to you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, look, the thing is, um, you had a caller on before saying about, um, you know, I want to see Boris Johnson out and his cabinet and put a new one in. Well, that's even if you got that and you put a, 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 a you know, a, a cabinet in that was um, for fracking and for getting, like, the country moving energy-wise again instead of relying on wind and solar power you'd still get these you still get these people demonstrating in the streets and blocking off roads saying that uh, uh, you know climate change is real with the, you know and we're not the main drivers of it we're in fact we're going out on a limb to harm ourselves with with economically with um 
with all the measures that we're taking. As you, as he said, he's got Boris out in uh, wherever New uh, in New York or wherever. Indeed, I mean you're, you're uh, quite right. You're quite right, Paul, because the reality is that the United Kingdom is responsible for about one percent of global emissions, and you've got China that is responsible for give or take 30% of emissions that is still planning to build literally hundreds of coal-fired power stations. So, you know, we're literally hair virtue signalling at the expense of tens of millions of British families, uh, you know, whilst other countries, the likes of China, they're literally laughing at us as far as I can see. And, and you know, the other ironical thing is that we're trying to destroy... Uh, carbon emission, like carbon, CO2, and yet we need it to for all our food and fizzy drinks packaging and stuff. It's... So the very elephant in the room we're trying to kick out the ass is the is the very elephant that's that's driving part of our economy. What a wonderful analogy there. Um, uh, it's it's a great picture, Paul. Thank you so much for that thought. Paul's view is uh, that there's an irony, isn't there, between we're trying to get rid of CO2 and yet we actually discover that we're incredibly reliant on, guess what, folks? Producing and capturing CO2 for critical things like um, like our, our, our medical operations, like the manufacture and storage and, and distribution of food, amongst others. We're really learning about the importance of self-reliance. I've got Duncan from Teesside on the line. Duncan, good morning. What are your thoughts? Good morning, Richard. Keep up the good work, Matt. Thank you. There's not many people doing it. <laughs> what? Tell but us, tell us your thoughts. Lunatics. The insulate Britain, is it? Insulate Britain, yeah, or insult Britain, as someone else said. Now, now I'm sixty, and I've got a good memory. Now I can remember, not that long back, having a nationwide campaign where the government was throwing money at homes to insulate the lofts. You're quite right. And I had a friend who made a killing out of this. Right, so he worked hard and he was successful. And then what happened? He stole. Then the next thing, we had another government comp- campaign where they were throwing money to get your cavity wall insulated. And again, he made a killing at it. So where are all of these uninsulated homes? Well, because that's... I presume new build homes come pre insulated. That's you're absolutely right, Duncan. So I can confirm because I've been involved in the business of of, of home building. That new homes are incredibly efficient, very, very well insulated, very low cost. But uh, th- th- there are millions of homes that have been upgraded. But there are, of course, because there's almost 30 million homes in the country, there's many that haven't. Um, Duncan, thank you for those thoughts. Well, Coming up. Can I just um, quickly say it? Go on, Duncan. The, the one thing I haven't heard in all of this conversation on anywhere is how much CO2 we have. Well, because they never mention it, it's because it's so small. Um, well, that, that's right. We're learning a lot about it and our reliance on producing it where we need it. Duncan from Teesside, thank you so much indeed. We are approaching the top of the hour. Coming up in the third hour of the show, I'm going to be looking at the uh, the incredible documentary that's available on Talk TV's website about the Wuhan lab leak theory. I promise you I'm going to talk about it. You need to watch it. You need to make sure. We've had an extraordinary two hours so far. We've had some great guests from the Labour conference, we've had Esther McVeigh. There's been a lot going on. I think people, the mood clearly is we need to be self-reliant on our own energy. We need to start pro-fracking. You're listening to Tice Talk here at the home of common sense. It's Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. Live at 12, I'm Helena Humphrey. The Transport Secretary urges drivers to only get fuel if they need to, as temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are approved to help the supply chain. A 38-year-old man is arrested on suspicion of the murder of school teacher Sabina Nessa in what police call a significant development. And boxing champion Anthony Joshua loses his world titles after being defeated by Alexander Yusik. The Transport Secretary has said there is no fuel shortage as he urged motorists to only fill up when they need to. He's accused haulage groups of creating a manufactured situation which sparked long queues at petrol stations across the country. Grant Shapps also defended plans to offer 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas in a bid to help with supply chain issues leading up to Christmas. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer said that the Prime Minister needs to do more. And I'm astonished that the government, knowing the situation, is not acting today. The Prime Minister needs to say today what he's going to do. There are 100,000 vacancies for drivers. There are shortages. I went up the road here out of Brighton yesterday. Right. There are three petrol stations, one of them with a massive queue, two of them with signs saying no fuel. Police have arrested a 38-year-old man on suspicion of murdering Sabina Nessa, calling it a significant development in their investigation. The man was apprehended at an address in East Sussex at around 3 a.m. this morning. Sabina Nessa, a 28-year-old primary school teacher, was murdered while walking through a park in south-east London just over a week ago. Three people have died and more than 50 others have been injured after a train derailed in the U.S. state of Montana. Several carriages on an Empire Builder service which runs between Seattle and Chicago came off the tracks at 4 o'clock local time. 141 passengers and 16 crew members were on board. Voters in Germany will decide who will succeed the long-serving Chancellor Angela Merkel as parliamentary elections take place today. Polls are too close to call which could lead to months of complicated coalition wrangling. And Anthony Joshua's reign as world heavyweight champion was ended last night after losing to Alexander Yusik at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. Joshua said after the fight, he's already planning the rematch. I can't go back and salt. That's wasting time. I'm going back to look at ways I can improve straight away. I've already been watching the fight and figuring out, oh, I could have done that better already in my mind anyway. So, yeah, I'm not too bothered. But what I'm bothered about is how much better I can get. And your weather turning cooler and more unsettled today with wet and windy weather on its way. Southern parts may see some sunshine. And that's your live news on Talk Radio TV. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB+, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk here on Talk Radio. And good afternoon. Yes, unbelievably, the time has flown by. We are into the last hour, the third hour of my show. We've been talking about the energy crisis, the predictability of what's occurring, and I want your thoughts, your views, 0344 499 1000. Are you pro-fracking or against fracking? A source of cheap energy literally under our feet. We've got some great uh, great tweets coming in also. Uh, one here about the, uh, the visas, whether or not to give lorry drivers visas, uh, who says totally against visas being given out. Uh, get the DVLA staff back to work and employ and test more people to become lorry drivers. Uh, how many unemployed people have we got? Uh, we've got another one here about insulation. Richard, you're correct that modern homes are extremely well insulated, but they're so well insulated, it's a bit too warm in the warmer months. And uh, Adrian says, I need to run air conditioning all through the warmer months because it's too warm. Uh, well, there we are. Sometimes it's not perfect. That's the nature of it. But keep those calls coming uh, with your views, your thoughts, whether you think we're being well led, badly led, whether you think the Labour Party with their conference could come up with some alternative solutions or whether you're looking for something else. I'm now going to talk about uh, the incredible one hour long 
documentary, uh, which is on the Talk, Talk Radio TV website, which I absolutely urge everybody, if you can, to watch. Uh, it's an investigation by a lady called Sherry Markson about uh, the, the, the laboratory leak theory, uh, which has been circulating uh, in the Wuhan, uh, that may have taken place in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It really is a must-watch program, brilliantly put together. If you remember back at the beginning of the COVID crisis, we were all told, and it was reported verbatim, that this virus had, had literally sort of jumped across from the bats in the wet markets of Wuhan uh, to humans, and that was the origin of it. And anybody who tried to even suggest that it could be anything else was a conspiracy theorist. And indeed, there were letters organised by a British scientist, signed by uh, almost 30 other scientists, uh, saying that it was, it was a conspiracy theory. It had clearly come from the wet markets. But it did always seem to me a bit of a coincidence that uh, Wuhan, a city that most people, of course, had never heard of in China, was also home to a very sophisticated institute of virology. And that got a lot of other people thinking too. And uh, this documentary, um, it really is uh, truly remarkable. It's got some incredible interviews with former President Donald Trump, with the former US Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, with the former MI6 uh, director, British director, Sir Richard Dearlove, with their thoughts really comprehensive and what's really interesting about their interviews is they clearly know a lot more than they were prepared to actually discuss in those interviews uh, for national security reasons but it's quite clear that they are very very uh, resolute that, um, that that essentially the virus came from a laboratory leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and it's interesting some of the evidence that comes out now I, I didn't realise, for example, that back in October, there was a thing called the military games, sort of the worldwide military's equivalent of the Olympic games, which was held in October 19 in none other than, guess where? Wuhan, yes? And the reports of hundreds of athletes being sick after that military games. There were some 9,000 uh, athletes uh, from militaries from over 100 countries, pretty extraordinary. Uh, to me, but the suggestion that actually the virus was already circulating in Wuhan in October, and some great interview with a very famous defector uh, from China, Wei Jingsheng, uh, with his thoughts, his contacts still in China, um, and that indeed at the Institute of Virology in Wuhan itself, uh, back in October, that three scientists were really ill, that I think it was in November time, there were already literally uh, body bags lining up uh, near and outside the Institute. Um, and there are people who told, and this is really interesting, who told the US intelligence uh, about these issues arises, arising in Wuhan back in October, November time last year. So here's a thought, that parts of the US intelligence actually knew that something was going on, that there's a, there was a virus circulating in Wuhan in the last quarter of last year. But there was a great comment, I think, from Mike Pompeo, who says sometimes uh, they've got, they're have got they literally drowning in data in some of these intelligence services. And what they haven't got is actually the ability to stand back and to look at it and spot the really important stuff. And that clearly is probably one of the lessons to be learned. And it's interesting that this, this Institute of Virology had clearly taken bats with viruses from bat caves hundreds and hundreds of mile, miles away uh, back to the Institute. And uh, they'd always said uh, that actually there were no bats in the Institute. But incredibly, new evidence has emerged uh, from this documentary, the people doing the investigation, who actually discovered a video produced by none other than the Institute of Virology itself back in 2017, within which, guess what? There are pictures of, you guessed it, bats. So 
it clearly shows that actually you cannot trust a single thing that, uh, that they say. There's evidence about whistleblowing journalists in and around Wuhan who were trying to expose what was going on, who then suddenly, literally, disappeared. Scientists at the Institute itself who disappeared. Databases, again, from the Institute itself that, guess what, literally disappeared. Uh, there was a two-week cell phone blackout at the Institute. I mean, this is all extraordinary stuff. I do urge you to watch it. And that there's no doubt that there was, there was evidence emerging uh, in the last quarter of last year. I've got friends, actually, who were incredibly ill uh, in January of 2020, before, really, frankly, most people had heard of COVID or focused on it at all. And it just seems you've got uh, this extraordinary situation where now it's, it's essentially the mainstream thinking that there was some form of lab leak, um, most, most, most likely accidental. And that's now the mainstream thinking. And yet, back in early 2020, uh, anybody who suggested that was a conspiracy theorist. And maybe it was almost like unfortunate that the first person who really started talking about this lab leak theory was President Trump. And because the mainstream media, anything that Trump said, they absolutely went for him and they said the opposite must be true. But it turns out he may well have been right. And it, it, I just, it, the other thing that's really interesting is uh, the evidence around the, the equivalent of our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, in the US who I think's got, uh, you know, he's he's playing quite an interesting role here because it turns out, despite his protestations to the contrary, that actually he did approve, without possibly many other people knowing, he approved US funding of certain research projects at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. He denied it, but the truth is, and it's called something called gain of function research, which is, which is where you're actually uh, you're carrying out research on things that you never want to happen. Um, and he said he wanted this to take place a long, long way away. He didn't want this gain-of-function research to happen on US soil. So he funded it in China. And we're all paying the consequences. It's also interesting evidence in the documentary about the links to the World Health Organization, which is now really uh, in, in the hands of uh, China, it's, it's dominated, its leadership has been dominated by uh, Chinese influence. And the extent to which the World Health Organization's investigation was utterly compromised at the beginning of 2021. Um, questions like why didn't China, when they knew there was an issue, why didn't they stop Chinese flights? An extraordinary documentary. I really do urge all of you to watch it. It's clear to me that you cannot trust a single word that comes out of the Chinese Communist regime. And President Biden's 18 intelligence agencies, they've just produced a report about this theory. They've been looking into it. And interestingly, their report is inconclusive. Um, some of the agencies are split about this issue as to whether the evidence really exists or not. I wonder actually whether they themselves are a bit embarrassed because certain US intelligence agencies had evidence about this virus in late 2019 and didn't pick it up, didn't do anything with it. Whatever you do, make sure you watch that documentary. The time is approaching 12.14. Coming up after the break, we'll be talking to a Liberal Democrat uh, MP, Alistair Carmichael, about uh, the new drugs policy that's just emerged in Scotland. Who knew? We'll be learning more about it after the break. You're listening to Tice Talk. It is, of course, the one and only, the home of common sense, Talk Radio. Online. On DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Good afternoon and welcome back to Ties Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 18 minutes past 12 and we've been covering a huge range of issues this morning. I want to hear from you, 0344 499 1000. Particularly, what are you seeing at the petrol stations, the garages? Is the other queues easing off as many people have now filled up? Or have all the stations essentially run out? Give us a call, send us a text, a tweet to let us know your experiences. Now, we're going to move on to something extraordinary that's happened uh, during all this uh, all the noise of the last week or so, uh, something extraordinary has happened in Scotland, um, really with very little debate or discussion, certainly that, that I've noticed, and I suspect uh, many of you have noticed, in that um, there's been a significant shift, as I understand, in the, uh, the way that uh, the drug laws are being interpreted by the authorities, by the police, uh, by the justice system, in Scotland. But I'm delighted now that I'm to be joined by Alistair Carmichael, uh, M the Liberal Democrat MP for Orkney and the Shetland and spokesperson on Home Affairs, Northern Ireland and constitutional reform, who will be able to hopefully shed a bit more light on what's going on. Alistair, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. So um, could you just help my listeners a bit? What exactly has changed uh, over the last yeah. week or so? And and what does this mean for the future of uh, of sort of drug laws in Scotland? Okay, put very simply. Good afternoon, Richard. It's good to join you. Thank you. Um, essentially, what has happened here is that the Lord Advocate, the head of the prosecution service in Scotland, has now told police officers that they can give warnings for possession of class A drugs. So that would be things like heroin and cocaine. It's been the case for years that in Scotland, and I think probably in other parts of the United Kingdom as well, police have had the power to give warnings for class B and class C drugs. So that would be things like cannabis or prescription drugs, tranquilizers, that sort of thing, which can be used uh, uh, without prescription uh, for, for recreational purposes, shall we say. So, you know, what will this mean for the future? I think very much remains to be seen. First of all, it is a power that the police can use. My suspicion is that they probably will use it and quite extensively. And if they do, then effectively you will have got to the place in Scotland where you have decriminalised simple possession of cannabis, uh, sorry, a bigger pardon of, of heroin, cocaine and other class A drugs. I mean, I listen now, this, yeah, this I, is... I mean, I'm going to say, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there's a, you know, there are upsides and downsides to it. I just don't think that the police are the people who should be making that decision. Well, well, that's right. And I mean, I, this is this strikes me as being incredibly significant. And and just to clarify for my listeners, uh, the reason that um, Scotland is able to uh, essentially to, to make this decision on its own is because uh, drug laws come under the, the devolution under health. That's right, isn't it, Alistair? Well, actually, no. Uh, the, the Misuse of Drugs Act, that's, you know, what drugs are illegal, what are not, is still uh, common across the whole of the United Kingdom. But policing and health are uh, devolved. So it's up to the police. They okay. can't change the law that something is illegal or not but what they can say is that if you're caught doing it then you will be put to court or not and that's what's happened here that's a really uh, that's a really helpful clarification yeah. but i mean this is really significant you're basically saying that heroin use cocaine use class a drugs use in scotland has been decriminalized at the same time that scotland i think i'm right in saying has got the highest drug death rates in certainly the United Kingdom, and I think I'm right in saying across um, much of Europe. I think you're you're right about that. I'm not certain about the Europe point, but certainly the number of drug deaths in Scotland is something in the region of about three times higher than any other part of the United Kingdom. And, you know, there are a number of reasons for that. And effectively, you know, I think we have to be careful about thinking that this is going to make too much difference to that. 
really, if you want to tackle the question of drug space, then I think there is some merit in saying we take drugs out of the courts and make it a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. Um, and, you know, we, we look again at the whole uh, way in which we treat uh, addicts because uh, Class A drugs are highly addictive. And uh, the truth of the matter is, and I work as a lawyer in the criminal courts for you know, before I was elected to Parliament, which was 20 years ago, but I saw it for myself that actually one of the best ways of making somebody's drug habit worse was to send them to prison. And I'm pretty sure that's not changed over the years. You know, the big frustration for me as somebody who's been in Parliament for 20 years is that we've had a succession of Home Secretaries and others saying, we've got to get tough on this, meaning that we're just going to do the same thing that we've Indeed. done and has it's now for decades. So, you know, we need an open, honest conversation about this. Well, the, the, what the police are doing here might actually be the catalyst for that. And, so, and yeah, how, how, they, how ironic, Alistair, that, that in a sense, it, this discussion is being forced on on the mainstream Westminster politicians. Um, just remind me of the because um, I think the Liberal Democrats have a uh, quite a different view on uh, on decriminalisation of drugs to the other two uh, main parties. Where where is the Lib Dem policy at the moment on this? Well, I mean, we were early adopters, shall we say, of um, legalisation. In fact, not just decriminalisation of cannabis and and uh, other Class B drugs. We take a more cautious approach in relation to class a there are interesting things that happen across other parts of europe that i think we can have a look at yeah. and you know look we we change the road traffic act about every 10 to 15 years but for drugs misuse which has changed massively things like ecstasy and, and a lot of the recreational drugs had not even been thought of when we had the misuse of drugs act uh, passed in 1972 so you know the whole thing is is long overdue a root and branch reform here i think actually you know we could look at what people have done in ireland and australia where they've taken a citizens assembly and dealt with really big difficult issues there like abortion and a um, you know equal I think, marriage and i think it's... if you do that thing it takes some of the polit political heat out of it what you've got here is the police stepping in because politics has failed. Correct. That, that, that's the point. But actually, you know, I, I think we do need a proper national conversation about this. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, drugs have evolved, the types of drugs, the chemical drugs. There's some there's some awful stuff that goes on. But Westminster politicians seem afraid of actually trusting the people to have a grown up proper debate yeah. and a conversation about this. I'm not a fan of Sadiq Khan, but he did promise in the London mayoral election that he would set up a commission to look at, uh, you know, drug use and whether or not there should be some form of, uh, I think, decriminalisation or legalisation. I think we do need to treat everybody as grown ups and have that conversation, have that debate, yeah. possibly even. Well, Alistair, I mean, uh, why not trust the people? You could almost do it, whether you do it by by the individual four nations or by indeed individual cities, you could actually have a referendum and let the people decide after a proper grown-up debate on this. Well, I mean, that's taking you into the territory that Switzerland's in, where they have referendums and all sorts of things. The only problem with referendums, single issues like that, is that very often there will be another sort of side of the coin that you don't explore. So you can have a referendum, for example, and say, do you want to spend so many extra billions on the NHS? And of course, people will say that yes to that but if you don't ask them are you prepared to pay higher taxes for it then you you Indeed. end up with a kind of, of, of log jam there i think you know there is a space we, westminster politicians have been far too scared for years for decades forever probably of the opinion editorials in the daily mail uh, you know the papers like that that have always been a bit behind the curve and you know people in general in, in westminster are slow to trust the population so um you know I, I think if that, you that, think that, of that, the way that's right Alison, because the truth is very often the people are way ahead of the politicians on many of these social and cultural issues and and i really do think that yeah. you know we've got to have a grown-up proper debate about this because if you otherwise look what happened, yeah look people will want a uh, access to 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 drugs when when america went into prohibition in the 1920s and the 30s it didn't stop people using alcohol it just pushed it underground now nobody 
will sort of offer to sell you illicitly stilled whiskey, gin or vodka these days because you can go into any branch of any supermarket and buy it for yourself. And when you buy that whiskey, you know that it's something that is 40% alcohol by volume because there's a label on it that ha that says as much. And in fact, they have paid duty to the government for the privilege of, a, of, of producing it and selling it. I mean, the reality, the reality is, Alistair, we, we, we've, been, we, we've been fighting yeah. a drugs war for decades and decades. And in a sense, the authorities are losing that drugs war. And the definition of madness, and I think you alluded to it earlier, is when you keep trying to do the same thing and you expect a different answer, when actually you're just going to keep getting the same answer. And surely we've got to be brave enough uh, to have, a, have this proper debate. Uh, and, and, and sometimes in life, in leadership, you actually have to try things and see whether they work. Oh, absolutely. Look, that's uh, Einstein's great definition of insanity there. And, and, you know, a clever man whose words endure to this day. And, you know, I think actually what you have to do is you have to have a politics that, first of all, it stops politicians pretending that they know everything about everything and they've got all the answers. Um, a willingness to accept that there are wisdom in all political philosophies. Uh, and occasionally we will try things and they won't work. That's and right. when they don't work, then we should have the confidence and the security to say, hey, we tried it for good reasons. It didn't work. Didn't well, work. let's try something else. That's because right. even if, if the, the solution that we thought might be a solution hasn't worked, the Alistair. problem has not Alistair, you're so right. I think we do have to try things. In the, sadly, we, we, we've got to stop it there because of time. Fascinating discussion with you. We'll be coming back to it. Uh, you're listening to Ty's Talk, the home of common sense, discussing the big issues of the day. That was Alistair Carmichael, Liberal Democrat MP for Orkney and Shetland. A huge thanks to him. It's 12.30. You're listening to Ty's Talk. It's Talk Radio. Online and on your smart TV. Talk Radio TV News. With your headlines, I'm Helena Humphrey. The Transport Secretary urges drivers to only get fuel if they need to, as temporary visas for foreign lorry drivers are approved to help the supply chain. A 38 year old man's arrested on suspicion of the murder of schoolteacher Sabina Nessa in what police call a significant development. And boxing champion Anthony Joshua loses his world titles after being defeated by Alexander Yusik. The Transport Secretary has said there is no fuel shortage and he urged motorists to only fill up when they need to. He's accused haulage groups of creating a manufactured situation which sparked long queues at petrol stations across the country. Grant Shapps also defended plans to offer 10,500 lorry drivers and poultry workers temporary UK visas in a bid to help with supply chain issues leading up to Christmas. While Labour leader Sakir Starmer said that the Prime Minister needs to do more. Police have arrested a 38-year-old man on suspicion of murdering Sabina Nessa, calling it a significant development in the investigation. The man was apprehended at an address in East Sussex at around 3am this morning. Sabina Nessa, a 28-year-old primary school teacher, was murdered while walking through a park in south-east London just over a week ago. And Anthony Joshua's reign as world heavyweight champion was ended last night after losing to Alexander Yusik at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The Ukrainian was declared the winner with a unanimous points decision. Joshua said after the fight, he's already planning the rematch. I can't go back and salt. That's wasting time. I'm going back to look at ways I can improve straight away. I've already been watching the fight and figuring out, oh, I could have done that better already in my mind anyway. So, yeah, I'm not too bothered. But what I'm bothered about is how much better I can get. That's your news on Talk Radio TV. More in half an hour. Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio.
Welcome back to Tice Talk here on Talk Radio. It's 12.33. We're in literally to the last half hour of my show. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. We've had some great calls and lots of tweets. Keep them coming. What's going on in the petrol stations where you are? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? How are people feeling? Uh, we've got some tweets coming in here. Uh, the people buying, panic buying fuel are solely to blame, to blame for the fuel stations running out. That is clearly the only reason. Phil says, the only, uh, only decriminalise uh, drugs when the details of the dealer or the supplier is revealed. That's an interesting thought. Uh, another one here. Uh, hands up anyone who believes the Chinese communist regime. Perhaps the, their culture is so different from ours. Uh, and, and remember also their influence over the World Health Organization. Well, that is certainly part of... Uh, the evidence in that documentary, which is well, well worth listening to. So we've got, uh, we're going to talk about also now, uh, as we move towards the end of the show, uh, a bit of sport, um, some extraordinary uh, things going on in the world of cricket. Because um, whether this is a good idea, bad idea, I'll be interested in your thoughts. Is this the woke brigade taking over? Uh, yes, because the Marylebone Cricket Club uh, they decided that they needed to amend their laws uh, to change the, the wording so that uh, a batsman is no longer a batsman, uh, but actually a batter. Or, and batsmen are no longer batsmen, but they are batters. So uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Johnny Gold, sports broadcaster and uh, talk radio uh, presenter to help us on, on this, why this has happened. Uh, Johnny, very good morning to you. Um, uh, what, what's going on here? Is this is this sensible part of adjusting the regulations to take account of uh, the new things like the uh, the hundred or, or or what? Richard, uh, I, I think I know. Uh, no, I'm going to say here. Uh, We've got. Uh, so I think Johnny. We, Johnny, I think we're going to have to try and reconnect that line because sadly, technology, although I love it. Uh, is just failing us on that. We'll come back to Johnny Gould on that. Um, meanwhile, uh, more tweets coming in. The uh, uh, We've got one from NewsTube here. says, the lorry driver visa scheme seems to be a bit of a sham, uh, a different bias. Uh, hard to know there. Um, and then there's one here. We see uh, only, in the UK, only in the UK do we tolerate a tax increase uh, to pay for what we didn't get last year and yet we still can't access today. Uh, that's the NHS. Well, uh, who knows? Now, we've got a caller coming in from uh, Coventry. Uh, a very good morning to you. I think it's Will. Will, yeah. what's going on in in, uh, in and around Coventry with the fuel crisis? Uh, morning, Richard. Uh, what it is, I've come out this morning because I've got work tomorrow, and I haven't got much left on my dial, but I've gone to three or four normal service stations they're all kind off they've got all the yellow things on yes. their pumps so i thought the, the only thing i could do now because we've got a major morrison's there so i've gone there it, there's a look a mile queue so are you sitting in the queue now will oh no i've, I'm, I've just left it now because are you done you're filled up no because halfway through it your man comes up and says no diesel, no diesel. Oh. So I can't go to work now tomorrow. And it, because the dial's on the red, I can't go, you know, further afield looking round and round like that. Understood. I, it sounds, uh, well, I mean, that sounds, uh, that's like a sort of virtuous circle of a nightmare for you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I'm so sorry. Well, hopefully this afternoon it will ease and, uh, you know, some of the, the lorries will get out to supply some of your stations near Coventry. I'm delighted we're joined now uh, back, hopefully, with a better line, Johnny Gould. Uh, Johnny, hope, how, are you, how are you doing there? What's, uh, what's going on with, uh, with this new language in the world of cricket, batters and um, replacing batsmen? Richard, I am, good morning to you, I'm all for the women's game being given um, a sort of an equal footing to aid the women's game, just as we've seen for literally a century in tennis. Um, we see great champions. We have Emma Raducanu as our greatest 
uh, champion of, of tennis, in fact, of all British sport at the moment. And the same goes for women's cricket, which needs that, uh, that leg up, the same as football as well. But when we try to change the language, uh, I think that's a step too far. I mean, we all know that the word batter, as opposed to batsman, is something we enjoy of a Friday evening on our fish and chips, or it's something that, <laughs> that Aston Villa do to Manchester United at Old Trafford. Well, there we um, are. Yesterday. Um, of the villa. So is uh, this but, is so so, so you're, it sounds like you're not in favour of it. Um, I guess no. The, I guess the next I, question, Johnny, is is where does this end? What what's next? Well, I, I must tell you, Richard, there is a very nice way of ending this, and the way to do that is to perhaps encourage uh, those women who want to be women to be called bats women or bats woman, um, so that uh, men can be batsmen. Um, actors can be actresses. Why does everyone want to be a bloke? I mean, you know, the fairer sex um, and uh, that's woman is probably something that we would enjoy a bit more, wouldn't we? I mean, why do we have to... Why, why does equality have to always make sense? It doesn't make sense. It, it, I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's... Uh, I guess it, it seems a bit extreme uh, to me and I suspect many listeners, but no doubt they'll let me know with their thoughts calling in uh, or, or tweeting. Are there any other sports that's about to go this way uh, that I haven't thought of, do you think, Johnny? Well, we've, we've already, uh, we, we're seeing it in the, in, in, uh, in the NHS, of course. We're seeing it uh, in football as well. I think that uh, we're only a hop and a skip away from it, calling it the Men's World Cup, um, as opposed to the World Cup. Uh, they're tinkering a lot with, uh, with, with, with definitions there. I think it's fine to it's the women's Premier League. You know, the product is different. Women's tennis is different to men's tennis. It's played over three sets if it goes to a third set. And yes. play Emma, and of course, she only takes it in straight sets. That, that's the kind of champion she is. The men's game is played over five sets if you uh, have a highly Indeed. contested game. So the just... women's and men's games are totally different propositions. And long may that reign to try and engineer language where equality actually doesn't exist and, and needn't exist, I just don't understand, Richard. No, I, I get it. It sounds like you want to celebrate uh, the differences between the biological sexes as opposed to uh, try to sort of um, uh, e equalise them. And, Johnny, just before we let you go, um, the, uh, the big fight, the boxing uh, last night, Anthony Joshua, what on earth happened? I mean, you know, this was extraordinary. He was, you know, he, we all thought he was going to win, didn't we? Well, the experts say that uh, he didn't produce enough guile and that he was just about the big hitting. And I heard him in the immediate aftermath on our sister station. He learned from it and how he wanted to immediately make amends and bounce back. And doubtless he will. He's still young enough to do that. But he didn't show enough of the quality that you need to defend your titles. And uh, I'm afraid he was eaten up for breakfast. There is uh, an irony, though, isn't there? And he tries to defend his titles at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. <laughs> I think that might have been the design for all along. I've heard some amusing comments about that. Johnny Gould's um, uh, broadcaster and talk radio uh, presenter, thank you so much for those thoughts on uh, batters and batsmen and batswomen and on the big fight that Angie Joshua lost yesterday. Uh, don't forget, give us a call, 0344 499 1000 with your thoughts as we approach the last 15 minutes of the show. The time is 12.42. You're listening to Ty's Talk here at the home, the one and only home, the epicentre of common sense, Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.
This is Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB Plus, and on the Talk Radio app. This is Talk Radio. Welcome back to Ty's Talk. We are approaching the end of the show. We've got a great tweet in here from the Lincolnshire Poacher who's on form. Did the MCC ask all the ladies' teams what they would like to be called, or is this just another decision made by men thinking they know what's best for all? I think that'll get you talking over your Sunday lunch. Well, I'm delighted we've got a caller here, Amanda from East Sussex. Uh, good afternoon, Amanda. What are your thoughts on uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the energy crisis, and I think you've got some thoughts on the Labour conference, possibly. Yes, hi, Richard. Yeah, good to speak to you again. Um, yeah, so firstly, regarding the so-called climate emergency that we're all getting rammed down our throats Threats. all the time. Um, if, uh, if people go to look up um, a really great article by a NASA award-winning climate scientist by the name of Dr Roy Spencer... Um, he did a really great speech earlier on in the year, and he um, they've wrote uh, you know an article about it as well. Um, and he basically um, laid out how climate activists are actually using the fake climate emergency to basically eradicate our freedoms, and that's exactly what is now already starting to happen. Um, and he's an award-winning climate scientist, um, you know, uh, respected. Uh, by NASA, the space agency, and uh, he's actually obviously worked yeah. for NASA in the past. His name is Roy Spencer, Dr. Roy Spencer. Dr. Roy Spencer. Well, that, that, that's that's great, Amanda. Now, um, we've got other callers coming in. Um, uh, any thoughts on the Labour conference uh, you heard, yeah, they, did you hear earlier? Yeah, exactly. The sheer hypocrisy of their stance on vaccine passports, because they're actually asking for people to produce vaccine passports to enter their conference down at the Brighton Metropole. And the reason I know this is because that's where I go to my gym. So I went down there the other day and they had all the signs up outside asking for people to show a vaccine COVID pass to gain entry into the hotel, which is just sheer hypocrisy, because they're supposed to be not in support of vaccine passports. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So we were told. Well, uh, you know? That's very helpful. So uh, thank you for that, Amanda, about the Labour conference. Um, I think we've also got uh, we've got Bob from Poole uh, with some thoughts, I think, about, uh, about the Prime Minister. Bob, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Richard. Yes, um, Boris uh, was popular, but I think his popularity is waned now because people realise they can't plan anything. We all knew that the driver situation, HGV driver situation, was getting dire 12 months ago. We knew that the energy situation was getting bad. But, you know, what have they done about building a power station with our money rather than taking money from China? It's ridiculous that we, we as, a, as a sixth world force, uh, have to borrow money from China to build a power it's, station. It's, 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 complete, it's completely ridiculous. Bob, you're so right. The thing is, with leadership, you know, in a in a massive role like being prime minister, uh, you need great people around you. And I think there's two issues here. One is uh, that he he deliberately appointed a very weak cabinet uh, to make him look like you know the, the essentially the king of the castle. Um, exactly right. And, but the second thing is actually when he was mayor of London, he did have some really good uh, chiefs of staff around him. He had the late Sir Simon Milton, who I knew a little bit, um, and he had Sir Eddie Lister. Who he did bring into uh, into number ten, but uh, but has, has has gone recently. So you need those really high quality people, uh, you know, not just the run of the mill civil servants, um, to to think about these things and to do this planning for you, so that you can do the sales pitch, which is which is what Boris is brilliant at. The civil servants mainly are working from home, as we know from from one of the mandarins that that is encouraging people to work. Uh, only two days in the office, so they can't be dominated by men. Yeah, that that, statement. That, that's right. Um, Bob, thank you so much for that, uh, with your thoughts, that actually Boris, uh, you know, he can be capable, but he needs better help, higher quality help around him uh, in order to, frankly, to run the country properly, to manage the country properly. Um, well, we've had a, uh, a busy show. It's been pretty full on. I think we've got everybody's clear views about the energy crisis, about what's going on, and uh, we've had a really good discussion. I talked about the, uh, the Wuhan uh, documentary, um, what really happened in Wuhan. And I really do urge you 
uh, to watch it from conspiracy theorists to the credible intelligent reports, the origins of the pandemic. Where was it from? Um, this documentary is one hour long. Amazing interviews from senior political figures, intelligence officials, the likes of former US President Donald Trump, former US Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo, head of the MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove. Um, it, it's a great watch on talkradio.tv, what really happened in Wuhan. And you'll have uh, your thoughts, your views. Uh, we've got tweets still coming in uh, on what we've decided. Great one here from Stephen. Let the people decide. All of these issues like drug legislation could be resolved on a manifesto of a party that wants to get behind more discussion with the people, more more debates. We had lots of thoughts uh, from Esther McVeigh um, and uh, her thoughts. Interesting to hear from Lord Adonis uh, down in Brighton at the Labour Party conference. And talking of uh, conferences, well, I wonder, uh, our next presenter, uh, the one and only Bob Mills. Good afternoon to you, Bob. How do you like conferences? Have you ever been to a party I've never conference? been to a conference, <laughs> never been to anything. And you know Lord Adonis, you know Lord Adonis, I used to hear him and written and thought, what are you, he's a very educated man and a very, you know, concise man. And then I found something else that really upset me. He's never stood for any political office ever. Actually, no, you're sort of right. Well, he stood as a councillor once. No, he, he did actually stand for Change UK in oh, okay. the May 19 MEP election, uh, European elections um, down in the southwest country. But uh, I always presumed that to achieve that level of power and influence, you had to have come up through the ranks of yes, local council right. and all that sort of no, thing. No, he, he did stand there. Actually, I, I genuinely can't remember if he stood for Labour or Change UK. Uh. But um, uh, I, th I think it's fair to say he's never actually been elected mm. um but he has got some pretty strong views we've yes, had we've had a full-on morning we really have i know and it's been lots wonderful. of I've calls been out there. um you know lots of views uh i uh, i let rip with my sunday sermon not holding it back i mean you know it's extraordinary this sort of situation where we're all paying i mean you probably had you know letters through from your energy company saying you know guess what folks yeah. the bill's not going down it's yeah. going up by yeah. a significant percentage and this is just the beginning of it and the wonderful thing is what you do, you see, as well as presenting a wonderful show for the listening public, you take all the pressure off me. <laughs> so you, they're, now they've really had their fill. They're so absolutely full up with information. So, so you're going to chill them, calm now them I down relax with what? Them. I relax them. Shazia Mirza's outside. She's being in a little moment. Uh, the guys that do the show that goes wrong, which is hugely popular, hugely popular, all those. They're coming in. We've got people doing plays. We've got comedians going on tour. And we finish with live music, as we always do. So it's it's a nice three hours of Oasis. No nonsense. No messing around. Um, lots of messing around. Lots of messing lots around. Lots of nonsense. Uh, lots of nonsense. All right. But, um, yeah, no, well, that sounds fantastic. Well, I mean, th there's no question that uh, uh, people are sort of sitting in, in queues at petrol stations. Listen, this is what Did you someone notice said anything to me. coming in? No, this is what someone said to me. That the people who are most in need of the HGV drivers are the fuel companies. Yes. And rather than put in measures to train British fuel, you know, British HGV British drivers, drivers, that's right. They thought it would be better to get the government to let us have some money. And maybe if we issued an announcement that we'd have to close some of our stations because there's such a shortage, that would make yeah. the gov that Did would make people panic and therefore the government would be forced into backtracking and, and, and giving. Did you notice any queues coming in? Oh, loads, yeah. loads. I mean, I, I drove out somewhere. I drove to Gosport on on Friday, and I, I had enough petrol in the car. And that was fine. But the journey was so slow, and I was sometimes sitting in traffic, thinking, "Why is this road completely blocked? Is it roadworks?" And then I would see people pulling outside me and driving the wrong way, and getting in front of yes. these because they're just stopping to go into petrol stations. Uh, what I find so irritating is that actually. Uh, this crisis was so predictable and you know the, the the examiners the testers the bureaucracy unbelievable to think that these examiners um, some of them are, are, i think you're going on strike at a time of a national crisis because guess what they're being asked to do a few more tests yeah. every day yeah. or every week i mean seriously isn't this a time to roll our sleeves up get stuck in get See, the i come sorted. from a family um my father my grandfather were H hgv drivers and we've always had a great fleet of H, uh, HGV drivers in this country. And of there's course, no reason at all we can't again. But I, I think they've been underappreciated. It's a really responsible job, yeah. you know, driving a huge truck, thundering down the motorway. 
I mean, it's a it's a really really responsible yeah. job. I don't think I could do it. Um, but, you know, many do. I think they've been underpaid. I think the facilities have not been good enough. They've been taken for granted for way too long. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, some of the bureaucracy with it has been too difficult. And, you know, I just think that in a sense, um, it's quite right. They deserve proper pay, proper facilities to attract new people yeah. into the industry. Well, we've had a great busy show. I just want to say a huge thanks before I go to my amazing production team. Kept me on the straight and narrow uh, and hopefully... Everyone listening, everyone watching has enjoyed the show. I'll be back, same time, uh, different place next week. I'll be broadcasting, hopefully, from Manchester, if everything works. Thanks for listening. This is Ty's Talk. It is Talk Radio. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Offence archaeology on Twitter. Quite terrifying. Don't beg Jeff Bezos. Charge him for God's sake. Have a day off. Use some common sense. People can say whatever they want.